we go about making sure we're registered with the right organizations to go about doing this? Okay, um, there is a meeting. I did give you a number for the Jeff SGP um, a representative in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, yes, I got that. Tashika Haynes. Um, there is a, I, I am doing a, a Zoom session for them tomorrow on our regional beekeeping project where, you know, there'll be a, a collection of different beekeepers and organizations working together. Um, uh, to a single objective that we are we we have we've drafted. So okay. I would advise with Tashika. There's a guy called um, I can't remember his surname, but Alan. Al Alan is Mr. a young man. Mr. Williams. He's extension Sorry, Mr. Williams. Yes, Alan Williams. He's the extension officer for apiculture um, in Saint Vincent and the Grenadines, and he will be best positioned to direct your course. Right. He has been All a right. great help. Actually, he's he's actually visited. Um, yeah. Yeah, our, you know, our hives twice now and the inspections. Yeah, so, he's yeah. a wonderful young man. Yeah, um, so, you know, he's somebody that should really keep in, keep in contact with Alan and Alan should be able to direct your course. Okay. Um, but Thank you. if you want to get part of, if you want to integrate with a larger grouping of beekeepers quickly, um, I would advise you to touch base with Tashika. I think I sent you her number. Yes, you did. Um, Thank you very much. And there's a, there's a Zoom meeting tomorrow, which I'll be... I'll be, I've been invited to, to do a presentation on the regional project. Okay, um, that sounds good. From, so if you can get, be part, you could, you could be a part of that. I think you would get a lot of information. Um, but hopefully what we're trying to do here in, 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 in the honey show we're having in December, once I can, um, you know, get the, put in the right protocols um, between myself and Jeff, that we can um, allow in regional comp competitors so we'll have a regional class or an international class where yeah. everybody can enter honey and so once we can get the protocols and and uh, um, approved by the ministry of agriculture um that they you know that they're happy that you know we will have this they will allow us to just bring in um honey just for that one um occasion right you know, okay yes at least Plus, so we can have a real international event. Hopefully, COVID, everybody will got their injection by then. Yeah. And yeah. the airlines will be flying <laughs> and everything will be back to normal. And um, oh, you, know, you could yeah, come in right. person and compete. In, uh, you could come in person and compete. I know I want Carla and Jennifer to come down mm -hmm. to, uh, to judge our first competition. So the whole yeah. objective is to, you know, let's, let's get everybody vaccinated and do the right thing and let's everybody... Um, so that we can get back to normal of so yeah, some semblance just, of normal. Just a year, just a year ago, we were all saying this will be over in two weeks. Ah, God, it's yeah. yeah Eighteen months later, well, yeah. the, you know, the, the coin still hasn't dropped yet. But hopefully, no. everything is going to be sorted out, and um, you know, we can all travel and participate, and once again become, you know, appreciate being members of the human race and one big family, and all of us can function together just like a. Uh, our bees, you know, yes, one single purpose, you know. So let's let's hope we can get back into that direction. Um, I did have somebody from who also wanted to say something. This guy, um, this gentleman, let me find him. Let me find him. Yeah, Nick. Okay, so Nick's got his hand up. So Andy, you're good to go. Good to go. Thank you're you. You're not going to give us yeah. a few words. No, no, couple of Rolling Stone lines. You know, you I, know, you're not, not going to give us. It, At this no, moment in time, I just can't get any satisfaction. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, at that at that juncture, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna mute you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks Take a lot. Care. Thanks a lot, Andy. Keep in contact. Thanks, and if anything, you, you, okay. I'm sure I'll share my email and my telephone number, whatever. You could always touch base with me afterwards. Okay, right. thank you very much. Take care. Right. Um, and Nick, um, Nick, if you can unmute your mic and you can make your contribution, sir. Hello there. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are, sir. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Richard. And uh, I'm afraid I can't give you any Rolling Stones lyrics, so I'm feeling not as good as the previous the previous gentleman. Ah, so okay. I just wanted to say um, thanks for. I mean, yesterday I found a fascinating session. Uh, looking forward to today's session as well. Good. And I just wanted to say hello to everybody there, particularly the, yes. all the, bee the honey producers in St. Lucia. 
So my name is Nick, uh, Nick Schlepfer. So Nick is just fine. Okay. And um, I work for a company called Meliworks. And we've just, just been engaged uh, to do a project in St. Lucia. Though sadly, we're not going to be able to, to, to visit. It's horrible with all this COVID. Yes. But basically, we're, we're working with Export St. Lucia and the Inter-American Development Bank to help develop um, a, a plan for marketing St. Lucia honey in international markets. So it's great to be able to connect with, with you know, some, some beekeepers and some, some bee producers um, in St. Lucia over yesterday and today. And so what I just wanted to do, I mean, hopefully we're going to be, we're going to be in touch more over the coming weeks as Export St. Lucia is going to be putting us in touch with the different, the different beekeepers. But maybe if I could just leave my name and my contact details in the chat, and I'd be really, really looking forward to hearing from any, any uh, honey producers in St. Lucia that could be interested in this, in sort of developing uh, a, a plan for accessing international markets and for selling your, your honey abroad. So great to connect. Um, you know, I'll, as I said, I'll leave my contact details. It'd be great to hear from you. Any questions, just, just drop me an email. Okay. Cool. Right. Um, if anything, um, Nick, what you could probably do, maybe we could, I think I sent an email to your colleague um, and I did say if she needs anything, we can try and schedule a Zoom. Um, we can schedule a Zoom meeting and we could put together a few people and we could have a conversation. Um, so whenever you're ready, just touch base. I think you've got my contact information on my email address already. And um, yeah. we can definitely try to structure something um, with everybody at some point in time in the near future. That would be brilliant. Thanks very much indeed for that, Richard. Appreciate All it. All right, mate. Good. Okay, Cheers. so that was Nick from Melly Works. All right, so let's, um, any more hands up? Okay, uh, morning. Okay, we've got a couple of quick questions. Uh, <laughs> all right, so let's, I'm going to mute Nick. All right, um, so let's move forward. So it's now a little after 10. So, Carla, it's all yours. The, show, the, the floor is yours, should I say. Okay, wonderful. Can everybody hear me okay? I hope so. They should. Okay. Well, I am just really, I'm humbled and honored to be presenting to an international audience. Um, I'm not sure I've done that before in the beekeeping world, so I'm thrilled. Um, so what I and I missed yesterday, so hopefully I won't repeat very much from yesterday, but I do know Jennifer well, and I know that that was a wonderful presentation. So what I hope to do today is I hope to talk a little bit about, you know, now that you heard hours and hours of what you need to do, I hope to help give you some resources and places you can go to find some of that help. And also, um, I have a giant pep talk in my in in here about why you really should participate in the honey show. So just a minute or two about myself. Um, I've been keeping bees maybe 15 years, very early on. I was inspired by my mentor to um, enter honey shows. And my husband, who came from the wine industry, really gravitated towards the honey. And, you know, we've just been really excited and loving participating in the honey shows. So I, I actually have a full time job, uh, but on the side, we run the backyard farm. That's our apiary. And we have this nonprofit called the AP Solutions Consortium, which I will introduce you to today. OK, so here we go. So in every talk I give, I, I like to honor and just give, you know, gratitude I didn't come here by myself. I came here with the help of some very smart and wise mentors. And um, they really range from Virginia to Vermont to the United Kingdom. And uh, you know, I just like to honor them. So I list them here. So one of the things that's almost never mentioned when we talk about honey shows, it starts with the bees, right? I mean, you absolutely have to know what you're doing as a beekeeper and you have to set those bees up in good conditions to raise lots of honey and, and really wax too. So I like to just remind folks, it starts with the bees. And these are some pictures of a very full box of honey here and a beautiful frame of honey on the right. And secondly, 
you really have to remember that honey is a food product and you need the proper handling of the raw materials. And this, in this picture, essentially what uh, we're showing you is how all the honey boxes are put on these trays. So you don't see honey all over this truck. I mean, what would happen if there were honey all over this truck? It would be a massive cloud of bees. You would bring that into your extracting area. It would be very messy. You would have bees in your honey. So, you know, these, this is just a simple picture to show you, you know, one method of covering up your boxes uh, very, you know, very securely from bees. And even in this picture, you can see, well, the truck moves, so some of these boxes moves, bees are going to get in there. <clears throat> so, this is a saying most of us know, cleanliness is next to godliness. So remember that honey is a food product and you want to approach your extracting of honey um, like it is a food product with the highest standards of cleanliness. And guess what? All of the judging criteria in a honey show reflect the same exact concept, cleanliness, clear honey, lack of debris. You know, I'm sure Jennifer talked about that yesterday. I'll talk about that a little today. And cleanliness, from the entire process, from when you take the honey off to the extracting, to the packing of the honey in jars. Um, you're gonna see a lot of pictures today of how to handle jars and how to pick up honey by the lid. So not to get your fingerprints all over the jars. And this is an expression I got somewhere. The only thing better than washing your hands in the honey house is using clean gloves. And here in the States, I'm from the United States here, you know, when we are preparing for a honey show, we are often wearing those latex or rub or not dish gloves, but those like surgical gloves. So, you know, it's always helpful in the honey house to have a bucket of hot water or warm water and a box of gloves. Because this is what we're aiming for. This beautiful, stunning, gleaming display of honey, um, it does not come, you know, is not going to look this way if you have dirty hands and bees in your honey and you're just a mess. Um, a lot of my experience has been with the Eastern Apicultural Society, which is a very big organization here in the United States of beekeepers. And this is their honey show. Um, and I mean, everybody, it's a little weird presenting because I can only see Richard. I can't see anybody else. So oh. I don't know. I don't know your reactions. That's okay. You know, maybe you can just do like it's thumbs a, it's up. It's a webinar. It's a, it's yeah. a webinar. So <laughs> it's, a, it's okay. Everybody's, we've got everybody at the lock and key. In there. Okay. <laughs> well, hopefully everybody agrees that this is a beautiful site. And this is what, this is what we're aiming for in a honey show. I mean, I'm just talking about the one class honey, but. <clears throat> this is an inspiring site. So why? Why even bo why bother? Why bother entering a honey show? Well, I'm not a honey show historian, um, although I do love to study what I can find about the honey show. But from what I do know, honey shows had a real place in the United Kingdom and also in this country. You know, they were part of little local fairs. I don't know if you have that in the Caribbean, local fairs. And honey show entrants, they were able to use, you know, their prizes and their ribbons uh, for marketing. So you would go, you would go to a little fair and you're able to say, you know, my honey one or my wax or my candles one, won this. You know, secondly, who doesn't like a little bit of friendly competition to encourage you to do better? And Honey shows let us show our best skills, what we've learned, and those skills are reflected in our products, whether it be candles or honey or mead or something like that. Um, and again, a little bit of a repeat, but you can use your results from entering a honey show and your ribbons. You can use them to advertise your product and to get what we call here brand awareness. That would be like your label or your business. And then lastly, one of my favorite things to share, and I got this, I got this idea from my husband. 
there's so much bad news about bees. You know, what do we hear? We hear all about mites and diseases and colony collapse. So guess what? The Honey Show is our chance to spread positive news about honeybees and the products of the hive. And it's such a glorious way to do it, whether it's for other beekeepers or some honey shows invite the public. It allows us to tell the good news about honeybees. So you have to be in it to win it, right? That's right, that's right. You guys, you're not gonna win if you never enter. So this picture <clears throat> is from the National Honey Show in England. And as Richard was talking earlier about international entries, the National Honey Show in England has a class called Rest of the World, which means everybody except for those from the United Kingdom can enter this class, the rest of the world. And at the time, these are very special jars from, they're modeled after a, um, a jar made by a man, Charles Muth in the United States, they're a replica historic jar. And at the time they were not available anywhere outside of the United States. And my husband and I did the crazy thing of bringing honey on an airplane, which is, that's a whole different set of skills there. <laughs> <laughs> Bottling this honey, putting it on the shelf, and you can see this picture here. This picture here was on the front page of the British Beekeepers Association magazine. And here I am with my card. And you know what? We only won like fourth or fifth place, but I just want to show you that smile on my face because that's how good it feels to win any place in a honey show. And winning at the national is like just out of this world experience but you're not gonna have this experience unless you try. So give it a try. <clears throat> so wait, hold on a second. Okay, so this is also from the National Honey Show. This is my mentor, Mike Palmer, my husband, George Wilson. You can see here the 24 jar class. These are some of the prizes that they award at the National Honey Show. Now, <laughs> we don't have anything like that over here. Maybe you can aspire to, but this is just a glorious sight of the silver medals, the uh, silver trophies, you know, that are at the National Honey Show. But over here, our honey shows tend to look a little bit more like this. You know, this is in some kind of, you know, cold, dirty barn. But you know what? The feeling of getting this enormous best in show ribbon is the same. Whether I got a silver trophy or I, I got this little ribbon in this kind of you know country fair here, uh, and I you know I just want to show how exciting it is to be able to win anything. Now this is not the greatest picture, but you see I'm starting to show you how to hold the honey jars. You know, on the right here, this is a honey show that was a little bit of a mess, um, but even still, you know, it's still a glorious sight to see all this honey on display. And on the right, here is my friend winning the best in class for his mead. And just look at that face. Look how happy he is to win this beautiful silver plate. Um, so it's not just honey and products of the hive. There's also photographs. You know, this is me at the national showing off my photograph that was in the bee craft calendar. Nice, um, nice. Yeah, probably none of you have ever seen snow like that. We hardly see snow like that. This again is a prize winning photograph. I, I, I was awarded at EAS, you know. So again, you just, you have to be in it to win it. You know, I know I feel a little bit like a show off, but that's not my goal here. My goal is to inspire you, to inspire you to enter because you just never know. This photograph won first place. Who would have thought? Um, and again, just some photographs, some honey. This woman here, this is Virginia Webb. She's pretty well known in the honey show world. She won an enormous silver bowl and a silver plate for her honey. It's just a great feeling. Um, I will take a moment here just to tell you that for a long time in the United States, they use these horrible cards. 
And you can see they really block, they block the entire jar. You can't even see the honey from the shelf. So we have gotten away from using these cards, but in case anyone's wondering what are these giant things hanging off the honey, that, that's what that is. Okay, I think I'm almost done with the show off photos. These are not mine, okay. <laughs> I have nowhere near these expertise. But look what you can do with wax. I think if I'm correct, this is St. Valentine, you know, who's yes, yes, the yes. patron saint of beekeeping. I think this is a British fairy tale, Thumbelina from Peter Pan. Is that right? I'm pretty sure that's who this is. Incredible work. It's amazing what you can do with wax. And you can see these are honey entries right next to it, just how beautiful they look. <clears throat> Okay, Monica, Monica's on the call from Maryland. Monica won, she didn't just win first place, she won best in class. So that means she won the best honey out of light, medium, dark, maybe even comb. I don't know. How, she won the first place and this gorgeous silver plate. Look at her enormous smile. Let's take a guess. Is this the first time Monica entered a show or the 25th time? <laughs> who knows first time oh my first god time i mean this woman has a gift okay clearly but i just want to go back you got to be in it to win it you want this incredible smile on your face too one day you want your honey to have this gorgeous blue ribbon or any color ribbon you got to enter a honey show so thanks to monica for sharing some of these photos with us this is my friend mark Fiegel, let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven awards at the American Bee Federation. This is one of the most humble men I know. Um, he knows how to he knows how to prepare a product of the hive. So you know he may not have the same smile as Monica, but he is just as proud of his winning entries. Okay. So I'm going to take a break from all that pep talk. I hope I've inspired you to enter a honey show and given you some reasons why and introduced you to the AP Solutions Consortium. So this is a small not-for-profit organization that my husband and I run. And it is like a place that consolidates information about how to prepare honey and products of the hive. And you can see, uh, I hope, I hope I'm able to show you this live. You can see that we, we have different menus on top. And just as a drill down, you know, you can go here and a lot of what Jennifer went over yesterday, you can find under these tabs, how to prepare beeswax and comb honey and extracting. And also here, judging products you know, Richard, when he's ready to, you know, get into the weeds of the honey show, there's some sample rules. So I'm going to see if I can open. Okay, so can you see the website now? Yes, we can. I can, yeah. Okay, so, you know, let's see if I can get rid of that. Okay, so <clears throat> one of my favorite things is the event page. It's, it's actually a big motivation to why I even did this. So I try to get a list of different, <clears throat> you can see here's your event right here. I try to the best of my ability to find out about events and put them on this website. And let's see, Jennifer mentioned that she is speaking in April. So let's open up her event right here. If you open it up, whoops, sorry about that. Um, I'm nervous, so I'm shaking a little in my fingers <laughs> on the mouse. So you can see her event. You can save it to your own Google Calendar. All the information about the event is there. So we had a lot of slow months. It was really, really sad. And I am so happy to be able to list events again. Uh, I'll certainly put yours up here when it's scheduled. Um, at the beginning, there's a sign up. If you want to sign up for this website, um, once a month, it will list all the events that have been added. So that's events. Let's talk about product preparation. So if you go here, let's pick comb honey. You pick comb honey. There are a number of resources, how to make comb honey. You know, different resources, 
different, <clears throat> you know, different, some are videos, some are PowerPoints, but this will walk you through specifically, you know, how to make comb honey like a pro. Um, I try not to put anything up on here that's just kind of like any Joe. I try to put up only people that are really experts in their field. So Virginia Webb, she's absolutely one of the world's experts in products of the hive. She has a number of videos here. Mike Palmer's is also, you know. Hi, Carla, um, Carla sorry to disturb. Um, oh. What's, have you changed screen? Because we're still seeing the Appy Solutions Consortium. Page. Okay, let me try that again. Let yeah, me try you have it. to restart your yeah. shit. Oh, okay, well, that's weird, but okay, no problem. Let's restart your, your PowerPoint. Okay, so what I did is I went up under product preparation right, and I went down to Comb Honey. So, um, you know, just showing, it's just an example to show you, you know, what is under this this particular <clears throat> tab. Now, maybe I'm going to have to show you, maybe I'm going to have to show you for each one. And if, if so, can you see extracting now? Yes, we can. Okay. So again, these are, this is a fabulous, fabulous video of Virginia showing how to extract this is a PDF showing the process. So I'm not going to go through every product. I just want to show you, give you some ideas of some of the resources here. Um, you know, this was this was this is somewhat targeted for the beekeepers in Virginia. So we have special um, tabs just for Virginia rules and regulations. But a lot of this is um, applicable to everybody. So I don't know. Can you see this all about honey? Yes, we can. Okay, so this is, you know, less about honey shows, more about different things about honey itself, how it's made. Um, this is a really fun little video, uh, a history lesson about honey ma made in Virginia <clears throat> that features some of us. So that's just to give you some idea about what's on this page in terms of product preparation and marketing. So let's talk about honey shows. I'm going to go down to this show prep tips and tricks. So <clears throat> can everybody see this? Yes, I can. Okay. I can. Everybody should be able to. There, this is, I think, one of the places that you will want to look at if you're going to enter a honey show. I gathered a lot of information here. Um, to give folks a really wide range of links where they can go to get all, all those tips and tricks that Jennifer talked about yesterday. A lot of that is documented in these presentations. And once again, we have Virginia Webb because she did a series of four videos and she, she really knows what she's talking about. So I just really wanted to, to highlight this for folks so that they didn't, I'm sure folks left yesterday being absolutely amazed, but now today you're sitting there like, boy, did I take notes for everything she said? Well, guess what? You can come to this website, you can open up some of these documents and a lot of what you saw Jennifer talk, talking about are gonna be in these various presentations. Um, and then lastly, I'll just show you a little bit um, I have quite a lot of work to do on honey show rules here, but I have listed various rules from different kinds of honey shows <clears throat> here. Um, and, and, you know, anyway, I hope, I hope that's enough. I just encourage you to go to this website and, and you'll be able to find all sorts of stuff here. So let me see if I can manage to go back to my PowerPoint. So are we back at the PowerPoint now? Not yet. We're still on your website. Okay. Okay. I guess I have to share, like, stop share and then go back for yeah, whatever yeah, reason. Yeah. That's okay. Okay. So I know it's kind of a mouthful of a name. Richard maybe can put it in the chat. <clears throat> All right. So a few more pictures of beautiful products displayed in a honey show, just to give you an idea of what we're aiming for here. We're aiming for this level of cleanliness and shining beauty in a honey show. 
you know, honey show, I've seen honey shows everywhere from an outside tent, you know, to this window, to a garage, you know, it doesn't matter where you do it. <clears throat> this is the New Jersey, that's a state in the United States, the New Jersey Association Honey Show. And what they do when they judge their show, and you notice here, all the jars have their labels on them. And the reason they do that is because they put their honey show on display in the state capitol for three weeks. So remember right in the beginning, I was saying honey shows are the good news about beekeeping. So this is just an idea. A honey show isn't just about the competition and the prizes. A honey show can be about public education about bees and the products of the hive. So I just absolutely love this idea that this honey show is in the state capitol on display. This is the Minnesota Honey Show. Um, and I don't know whose picture this is. I, I borrowed it from the internet. This is one of the very largest honey shows in the United States. Um, and again, just a picture to show you just how incredible a honey show can be. So let's just spend a few more minutes talking about preparing for a honey show. The very first thing you need to do is read the show schedule and the show rules very closely. You need to understand what the guidelines are and what they're looking for because every show is different. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know what you're going to evolve to in St. Lucia or the Caribbean. Um, here in this country, every single show is different. So you really need to rule, know the rules and you really need to know the, what we call the entry times. You know, you can't, you can't show up two hours late with your entry. In most shows, they won't receive it. And all your effort, you know, it will, it will be very disappointing. Most shows give you some piece of paper that has comments or a numerical score. Um, so that's something I strongly encourage, I, especially in a small show. I encourage that the judges have the time to give you some feedback about your product. And sometimes in honey shows, um, another thing that I love to do is set up time where the judges are in the room there and they're able to talk to you about your entry and you're able to get actual feedback about your entry. So this is again, this is a picture of how you handle a jar for the honey show. This is another one of my, this was my first teacher actually, Mr. Robert Wellemeyer. Um, he's the first person to inspire me to enter a honey show. And here he is judging, judging a honey show. You can see his tools in the background, his water, his toothpicks for tasting, his refractometer case here. And the American system, we often use something called a polariscope instead of a torch. So I, I just love this picture because I see a lot in it. I see a lot in this picture. So how do you handle a jar for honey and what are the judges looking at? So a lot of these next slides, you're gonna see numbers because the American system gives a quantitative score which is different than what they do in Florida, in Georgia, and in the United Kingdom. But the things they're looking for, the criteria they're looking at are exactly the same. So I just wanted to explain what those numbers are. If you're not gonna use numbers, don't even worry about them. So what are we looking for in a jar of honey? We're looking for the cleanliness and the appearance of the container. I mean, look at this container. It is just absolutely sparkling clean. Freedom from crystals. Now, maybe in the Caribbean, this is not your problem because it's warm, but we have a big, big problem here with our honey crystallizing. So, you know, you want to make sure that you are treating that honey well, that you are storing it at, at good temperature so that you do not have crystals um, in the honey. That is why we use a polariscope or a torch or flashlight um, to look through the honey and, and see if you can see crystals. Filling accuracy. This one is my nemesis. This is the one that I struggle with the most. Um, there's usually very detailed instructions about how full the jar has to be. Essentially, you don't want to see light in between the lid and the jar. You want to only see honey. 
cleanliness from and freedom from foam. You know, I don't know how much Jennifer showed you yesterday, but that is like kind of like the white bubbly foamy stuff on top of the honey. If you watch some of those videos that I showed you, people will give you all sorts of tips and tricks about using a metal spoon to, to get the foam off. Uh, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of tricks. Now flavor. Predominantly flavor is only judged for objectionable things. Um, there is a black jar class, many do, that is just on taste. It's highly subjective. Most honey shows in the other classes are looking for, like, has this honey been overheated? Is it burnt? Is it fermented? Th those are the issues in, in flavor. And then lastly, density. And that's the water content in honey. Um, I know absolutely nothing about Caribbean honey, okay? So I, it could be that you have different honeys that are more watery or less watery. You know, I think this is something that, um, you know, you'll have to figure out if is density and how you want to judge density. Uh, we have a, I think a lot of the Caribbean honeys um, because of uh, the, we're in a tropical climate um, the, and the humidity, you'll find that the moisture content will be a little high. So it's something what I've always advised beekeepers that they need to focus on getting the moisture content down to at least 17%. Yeah. It's off the bat, it's normally like about um, 19 and above, which you know, okay, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's difficult. It's, yeah. already, it's already in the danger zone. So um, yeah. you need to focus on getting their hunt their honey down below 19%. And ideally in the ranges of 70, you know, down to somewhere in the range of 17, um, because honey is hydroscopic and it will draw the moisture from the air around you. So yeah, exactly. They, so they need to, I, we did discuss this yesterday and I did suggest that um, beekeepers should invest in a little refractometer, a little portable one, manual one. Um, you know, when you're in the field, you think you're ready to, to extract honey. Um, just take a couple of drops from the from the hive in the field and see where it's at. If it's at twenty percent and above, there is absolutely no reason to move that honey from from that location, yep. unless you've got a drying room uh, and you could you want to take invest money in electricity and fans and uh, a dehumidifier and some circulation, yep. you know, and all, all that stuff. So um, yep. we did touch on that yesterday. Okay. But moisture content, moisture is a, it would be an issue in the Caribbean, and it's something that they need, beekeepers need to be more, um, you know, zoom, they need to zoom in on that. That's yeah. What. Well, again, I just want to go back to my first slides about, you know, why enter a honey show. I mean, sure, I love all that. I love all the prizes. I love all that. But I also these are the same criteria that your honey should have if you're selling it and it should look this good on a store shelf. So we just don't make this stuff up because, you know, we're trying to drive everybody crazy to win a prize. These are the same criteria that you should be thinking about if you're, if you're selling honey or, or even just using it yourself. And so Richard has made a compelling argument about density and why density is so important. I will say in, um, in the United Kingdom, in the national, their density level, they, they, they call it 20% or less. And that has always um, been something very interesting to me. I've always just assumed, and I don't know this is true, that they also have quite a moisture problem. Um, mm. They, the British system does not use the, the measurements in the show. Um, you know, the American system, um, people die over this. This is like, I can't tell you enough how critical the moisture level of your honey is for most American judges. It, it's a little absurd, but yes. it, it is what it is. Okay. So uh, I hope this is helpful. You know, I, I'm sure Jennifer went over these things, but I thought it might be helpful just to have them on a PowerPoint just so you could actually see them. You know, I don't know. There's different opinions on this. I was taught to put the, I don't know if you call it cling film. We call it saran wrap. I, I was taught to put this and then take it off at the show. More recently, people have said that's totally unnecessary. Um, but th this is a remnant of when I used to do that. <clears throat> okay, cut comb honey. 
So just to, again, to go over some, um, some of the criteria, the judging criteria for cut comb, again, the container, is it clean and is it suitable? Is it the right container? Um, you know, many honey shows will tell you exactly what type of container they want you to use. You know, others are, are going to be less specific. Uniformity of, of appearance, boy, th this is a gorgeous example of cut comb. You see, you see this ridge is straight. You can even see how pretty uniform it is. I bet right here is where the judge put a glass rod in to taste it. Um, the weight is looked at, the absence of watery cappings and uncapped cells. The, uh, you can't really see watery cappings well from this distance. Um, the absence of travel stain, which is, you know, when the bees, you know, walk all over the comb. So you don't want dirty um, comb honey. You don't want pollen. You don't want crushed wax. You don't want a big pile of liquid honey seeping out of here. Uh, and you want it to be neat. So I think if you go to our website and you look at any of those videos or presentations, you will find a lot of tips about how to make sure you don't have liquid honey, how to cut this so that it looks this gorgeous. Um, you know, you can see here, there's, if you really, I mean, this is a highly competitive show. I know where this picture is from. At a highly competitive show, every little thing is gonna matter. And these little bubbles could be the difference between first and second place. But normally that's, you know, no one's even gonna see that. So I just wanted to give you a little bit about cut comb honey uh, and then chunk honey. So let me just say, my husband said, why are you using that picture? I said, because, you know, people should know what a, a poor, a poor selection is. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not the greatest. And, you know, first of all, there's these watery cappings, these dark cappings. It's totally uneven. It's floating. It's like, I don't know, it's like three inches from the bottom. So it's, it's cloudy. There's a lot wrong with this picture. Um, junk honey, I don't even know if you'll have it in the class. Junk honey, in my opinion, is the absolute hardest thing to produce well. Because you need to produce the honey well, and you need to essentially produce cut comb honey well. And then you need to combine it. Uh, and then get a piece that's going to stick to the bottom. There's all kinds of tips. I can't say any of them have worked for me really well, but I've, I've tried, I've given it a try. So essentially the criteria for chunk honey is a combination of that for extracted honey and that of cut comb. So I just want to give you a little picture there. So beeswax, this is my husband judging beeswax at the New Jersey State uh, Association show. You can see, you know, he what some of what judges look like, look at. He has a flashlight or maybe you call it a torch. He has a scale. You can see every entry has a piece of paper where he's going to write comments. You must have many, many pencils with you. There's his toothpicks back there, his... Uh, corkscrew for opening the mead. These are some of the items from a judging kit. So American shows predominantly ask for wax to be in blocks. Um, I don't know what you will do in St. Lucia or the Caribbean. You might go to the wax cake, which is a more rounded version of a wax block um, yes. that, that's used in Britain. But, you know, I, I'm just, I can only show you what I, what I know best. So I know wax blocks. Um, at EAS, it's a two pound block of wax. That's this, to me, this is just an absolutely stunning picture. You have no idea how hard it is to get a huge wax block to look like that with no cracks. This is the wax cake. This is what you see mostly in the United Kingdom and in the Florida shows. This might be what you are going to use in, in your show. Um, you know, you can't stick a flashlight or a torch through a two pound wax block, but generally you can through a wax cake. But even in this cake, my trained eye, I can see bumps, you know. <laughs> now, I know, look, 
this is a this is a picture i'm sure from a highly competitive show you know i mean if you're gonna have your first show everyone's just you got to just you got to be in it to win it you know you're not going to be perfect when you first start and that is fine you may never be perfect that's that's not necessarily the goal the goal is to just you know keep getting better so this is this is another thing that I have found very strange, but all American shows have it. The wax is always covered in the cling film or the saran wrap. And mostly that's because you don't want dust. You don't want stuff from the room getting on the wax. So, you know, I see this, I've saw this in England as well. So what are they looking at with wax? You know, predominantly they're looking at the color and the odor. Now, this is something that you might, you know, want some consultation on. You can see how light this is for whatever reason. You know, you see all these different colors of wax here, right? You know, this light canary yellow wax is what, you know, is what's going to win in the United Kingdom. I know when I was in Florida, Jennifer said that there be, they just don't produce wax of that color. So you, there's darker wax. So I think color is something, you know, that might be regionally determined. That's something you just might want to think about. Um, odor, it should smell, you know, it, when if you rub, if you rub a block, a uh, beeswax block with a linen cloth, you should get a nice odor from it. Um, <clears throat> It should be clean. Again, you don't want specks. You know, it's very easy to get specks of dirt or propolis. It should be uniform in appearance and it should not crack. And I, I don't know if Jennifer talked about cracking or not. I don't know if this will be a very, very different experience for you in the Caribbean because it's warm there. But if I'm wait, ma making a wax block and it's cold, you know, I, there's all sorts of tricks about letting it cool in a cooler, putting it in a hot oven. You know, there's a lot of tricks to getting it to cool at a consistent temperature instead of going from hot to cold. Because when it goes from hot to cold, that's where you risk um, cracks. Um, another one of my favorite tips is, um, I, I learned this from Michael Young, and he said he makes his wax in the middle of the night. You know, why does it, why, why would he make his wax in the middle of the night? And he says, well, I, I don't want the rustle of a lorry running by. So I didn't even know what a lorry was. Every car, every truck, every train that goes by in front of a house makes a rumble. When you are in a highly competitive shows, these are the things that keep you up at night. <laughs> you know, was it quiet and calm when your wax was cooling so that there are not jiggles and cracks. You know, again, I'm just trying to give you a really broad overview of, of what you might aspire to. Okay, I think I'm going to have to say this uh, to Richard or put it in the chat. Um, there's very, there's actually very little written on honey shows. I, th I th you know, this, this world is ripe for a brand new book about, <laughs> about honey shows. This is an old book. It's more like a pamphlet. It's, it's definitely based in the American system, but there, there's still a lot of good tips in this book. Uh, and it's available from Wickwas Press or possible, oh, oh, Amazon or Barnes and Noble. So this is a link to it. Another book, which is kind of like, you know, not really like a hardcover book, but like a pamphlet. And I should have, I'm sorry, I should have had these so I could have held them up, but, but I forgot. Um, this man, James Thompson from Ohio, he still has them. He has them for sale, you know, if you write to him. Um, the, these are both in the American system. So there's going to be an awful lot in there about quantitative scoring, you know, you can ignore that if you're not going to use it, but the key concepts of how to produce the entries are the same, absolutely the same. Okay, Carla, we have a couple of questions. Okay, but people have let's, their hands up, so I don't know if you want me to allow them to speak. Yeah, that's fine. We're good on time. All right, I'll start off with um, uh, oh, yeah, I'll start off with Andy Jagger. If Andy, you could unmute your mic. Okay, Andy, maybe, oh, he did say he's having some problems with his hands up, so, okay, okay. let's, um, 
Uh, let's try. I know it, I created this link for the beekeepers in Trinidad. Um, TT beekeepers, Richard Mathias, TT beekeepers. I know that's not me, but I, if you want to unmute um, and ask your question, I created that link for um, beekeepers in Trinidad. Nope. Okay. No one wants to speak. Okay. Um, I'm almost done. Marlon Crow, I'll try Marlon Crow. Marlon, you want to unmute your mic? Marlon Clark, unmute your mic and ask a question, please, sir. Go for it. No. Okay. Everyone got shy. <laughs> Seems so. Um, okay, let's try Lorraine. Um, Let's try Lorraine. Lorraine just came up, put her hand up. I said, Lorraine, go ahead. Unmute your mic and speak. Yeah, there you go, Lorraine, Hi, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Lorraine. Oh, great. Good morning. Good morning to you too. I had lots of difficulties with the computer, with internet and so, so I missed a whole chunk. Um, but I'll, so um, I might be asking a question that's not even relevant, but uh, is this, um, I see we are looking at shows in, in producing beeswax and, and going in for um, presentations. Correct. Are we going to have a, are we preparing for a presentation in the Caribbean? Yes, we are, madam. Fantastic. December. Solution. December. In Solution. <laughs> yes, okay. we are. We Great. hope to be there. Welcome. All right. Where are you calling? Where are you? Where are you I'm in Nevis. In Nevis. Wonderful. Yeah. Next door. Yes. So I'm so glad to see that something is coming there. The Nevis um, Bee Association seems to be kind of dormant and I'm hoping to get us back on track. Yeah, have you been in contact with Eilis at the Jeff SGP office? Is it Eilis? I think it's Eilis. Yeah, Eilis is in St. Kitts and Nevis. Okay, I'm stumped. Um, you're in St. Kitts, right? St. I'm Kitts in and Nevis, Nevis, right? Yes, okay, so... We have a regional beekeeping project funded okay. by Jeff SGP UNDP. I, I am new to this, so I'm trying to get all the information I can. I so had sent you messages, but uh, you have um, yes okay. on WhatsApp. On WhatsApp on about WhatsApp. a month ago. And what's, uh, what's up? I like that. <laughs> uh, uh, Resend to me. Re okay, to will do. Will do. And I can tr I could probably try and definitely have a, a longer conversation or just call me just call me via yes, what okay my number I tried seven, all of that, seven, but, uh, for that. this all is right. good okay so cool. okay. in december yes ma'am good so let's see how we could get saying it's on nevis and that give my regards to mr merchant okay i know mr merchant all right for, yes give my regards tell him i say hello Okay, will do. All right, take care. Thanks Actually, um, yes. Deslin Richards is the one who gave me your name. Okay, cool. Yes, yes, yeah. Leslin. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, she good. So we go hook up. Okay, let me let the, let me not take the show. Thank you, man. God <laughs> okay, bless. Good. Take care. Right. Thanks here. a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye. Um. Okay, we got Glenroy Blackman. He probably wants to say something. Okay, Glenroy, go ahead. Unmute your mic, please, Glenroy. Unmute your mic, Glenroy. Unmute. Yes. Hi, morning, morning, morning. No, my hand is in uh, touch that. I'm at work, so ah, <laughs> just, trying okay. to, just trying to tune in. No problem. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, cool. Man. No problem. All right. Enjoy. Uh, one last one, Roger. Let's try Roger. Roger, unmute your mic and ask your question, please. Hi, hello, good morning. Yes. And thank you. Um, one question. Um, you spoke about wax and you said um, mostly the lighter the wax, the better. Um, does that mean that you only could collect those wax for competition wise at a certain time of the year because I mean, bees forage on certain type of plant. Well, especially in the Caribbean, they forage on all different kind of plants. We don't have mm -hmm. this specialized one type of honey or one type of wax. It's a mixture. 
So I know certain time of the year, you will get certain color of wax. Yeah. Right? So that is what I, I was trying to get at. Does it mean that um, you will have to collect that wax for the competition, if you were the entire competition at a specific time? Well, let me, let me try to respond to that. Um, in this country, what, and also, I think also in, in England, the wax that is used predominantly is the wax from the honey frames, those wax cappings, because that is right, usually right. your cleanest. I, I think that this is a discussion you need to have it within among yourselves, knowing, mm -hmm. knowing your own flora. I was very surprised to hear in Florida about how their wax is not as light. I personally, I, I love dark wax. I've never fully understood this requirement. And I think you're going to need to figure that out. And, and Richard and his associates make a decision on color for your own right. show. Right. That makes sense. Okay. So I appreciate I that, that very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, thanks a lot, Roger, for your question. Uh, you're very um, much welcome, thank you. All right, mate, keep, enjoy the session and stay tuned, man. Um, yeah. Okay, Lauren, does Lauren have another question? Or she's not, um, we've got a question here from, uh, we have a, a response here from Stephanie Slater. Um, I wrote to James Thompson's a couple of years ago and he very kindly sent me his book. It is an excellent and well worth the low cost. So that was from yeah. um, Stephanie Slate. I think she's in the United States. Uh-huh. Yes. One, one, he's, he's a love, but he, he is not a young man. So. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, let's continue. Let's continue. We've digressed right. a little bit. Sorry. My so apologies. that's fine. No, I think it gives me a break. Um, you know, I'll send this list to Richard. Th these are the only books that I'm aware of that are specific for honey shows. You know, we hope and pray that Michael Young writes his book, but uh, he keeps saying he's doing it. So may maybe he will. But Again, even these two top books that are based in the American system will be useful to you. The National Honey Show has a series of brochures. Um, and there's some really wonderful presentations on the website that I showed you earlier. Okay, I think I'm almost done. Um, this is a little bit about the Honey Show. Uh, Jennifer sent this sample schedule uh, to Richard. You know, this is just more about the honey show itself, you know, and every honey show will have a schedule. You will see what classes and when entries are taken and the date. This doesn't have the location, but it should. Um, for EAS, we never make a honey show schedule quite like that. We make this big display. This is just an, it's just another example I wanted to show you where we, you know, we have the rules right here that people can come pick up and we have this big display and we, we honor the sponsors. Just, I'm just, I was just threw this out just to give you a couple of ideas of, of ways that you can do it. Um, you know, and in our system, the show schedule is really included in the rules. I happen to really like a separate show schedule because you just know right on one piece of paper, you know, the time, the location, the people, etc. cetera. Um, again, this is about honey shows and Richard, I will send you this offline. Um, all of us doing this work pretty much have all of this information in our head. Okay, it's all it's all up here and very little of it is written down. And um, something that Jennifer and I are working on together, along with a few key people, is to develop procedural guidelines for the Eastern Apicultural Society show. And these are, oh, I see my numbering got all messed up here. Well, no worry. You can see these are all the things you want to think about, your timeline, you know, your logistics, your rooms, your rules. There's a lot. It's a lot to think about. Um, and even though we don't have these procedures written down, just knowing the topics I think will be helpful to you. And a year from now, we really hope to have this written down for EAS. That's the Eastern Apicultural Society. And I think a lot of people will benefit from it 
um, because my guess is anybody you talk to who's running a honey show knows this stuff, um, but it's not written down. And I think, yeah, I think my last slide is, you know, just, I just borrowed this from the Merrill, the folks in Maryland, just a general timeline. That's something, Richard, for you to think about, you know, to think about what, what you need to have done by when so december is not that far off i yes. think you told you told me you already have a room so that's good so you're that's a check mark there so these are documents i'll i'll send these to you just so you have them we, I we think have two potential locations um i will do it in in uh, capital castries or we'll do it in the yeah. south of the island somewhere um, Great. Uh, so but we'll have an, a very interesting location um, any questions and answers? I see Lauren. Lauren has a hand up again. Um, Lauren, you could ask your question. Unmute your mic and ask your question if you have a second question. Or if your hand stayed up in error, not a problem. Lauren Archibald. Lauren, come in. Question, Lauren? No? Okay. No props. Um, does anybody have any f closing comments? Anybody have any closing comments? I hope it's been helpful. I, I know you, I really felt nervous following Jennifer yesterday. <laughs> uh, um, Jenna, Jennifer is a, is a superstar, man. She went on for like, what, we started at 10. And I think we concluded at uh, 2.30. Yeah, 2.30. So she's a superstar, man. She went right through. Um, yeah. But you, no, you are doing a great job. As Emily Gannon says, don't worry with Richard, you are doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it's been helpful. And no. yes, if yes. nothing else, you have that website to go back to. I'll put that in the chat when I get offline um, here. Okay, uh, we got... Mark Remy from St. Lucia, he has a quick question, compliment, well, it's a quick statement, compliments to the organizers of the Honey Show Workshop, special thanks to presenters, farmers with disability, beekeepers are looking forward to participate in the show. Due to COVID-19, we slowed down a bit. Any material available to us will be greatly appreciated. Yes, Mark Remy, thank you for that. We def Thank you for joining us. We will definitely be sending you some emails and I have some good news for you. Uh, you'll be getting an early Christmas gift through our regional project that I will allow Mr. Romulus to fill you in on. Um, I will not steal his thunder. So look out for a call from Mr. Romulus in the coming weeks because he has a nice surprise for you. Um, compliments of the regional project that we are under to, we're just about to undertake. Um, Leslie-Anne says, I missed yesterday. Would they be recorded and available? Yes, Leslie-Anne. We have everything on, on our YouTube and Facebook channels. Um, you can get our Facebook page. Well, the current presentation, I'm going to drop the link in now. Um, so once you get to that link, you can find yesterday's link there also. Um, and just subscribe to the chat, sub subscribe to the Facebook page and you'll get regular updates and you can go to our website, ironolaapiculture.org for further information. Um, Leslie Ann McIntosh writes, thank you for the knowledge and the presentation. Thank you, Leslie Ann. Um, who else? Who else? Who else? Nobody else. Nobody else for now. Um, we're waiting for a second presenter. Where is Mr. Gladstone Solomon? Uh, where is he? He's late. Let me call him and find out where he is. Give me a second, folks. Let me call Mr. Gladstone Solomon and see where he's at.
Okay, guys, um, Gladstone's coming. Um, whilst we, uh, there's a few chats there, Richard, good day. For those of us who do not know about, by the way, able to stay for the whole session, please send a link. Yeah, uh, Melanie, here's a link to the Facebook page. You can grab it on the Facebook. Um, she says, thank, great presentation, lots of to learn and digest. So thank you, Melanie. She's, Melanie's from St. Lucia. Uh, Juliana, please add me to the newsletter, Mr. Matthias. Okay, I shall add you to the newsletter. Risha, Risha, think, I think I'm on the mailing list for newsletters and notifications. Please check if not add. Yes, you are. Okay, I shall do that. Um, any more questions? Any more questions? Um, no more questions? Uh, okay, Dean, I'll have to get back to you. <laughs> um, all right. Um, we are waiting for Mr. Solomon. We are waiting, Mr. Solomon. So Carla, any, any more comments, any more tips and tricks? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, don't wait to the last minute. Yeah, I'm guilty of this. You know, uh, you can't make a wax block the night before the honey show. <laughs> and yes. it's hard because, you know, depend I mean, I don't know what your season is like, or what December is like, but, you know, it's some it's hard sometimes to take the time to practice, you know, you should practice filling your jars or practice. So, you know, beekeeping, beekeeping is a good, it's a good test of patience. Um <clears throat> So preparing for a honey show is also a very good test of patience. Uh, what else can I say? I don't know. I, I guess I can say that um, beekeeping has brought me to places I never imagined and participating in honey shows as well. So you just never know what, what you're going to meet, who you're going to meet, or the friends you're going to make by participating. And it's really, the Caribbean beekeepers in general is just really exciting to see. And it's thrilling to think that you'll have possibly an international honey show. There you go. All things being equal. Yeah. All right, where is Mr. Solomon? I don't see where him. Where is he? I just he spoke to him, and he's using the wrong link. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to try and send him a link now. All right. So I'm sending him a link. Let me call it. Let me just call him back and tell him I just okay. a link. Because he should have just been able to use the same link he used. Yeah. Yesterday. Let me call him back. Excuse me one second, folks. So I don't know if you can hear me, Lorraine. No, I think not. I'll hear type answer. Richard, I don't know if you can hear me. Hmm. What happened to my sound? I can hear oh. you. I can hear oh. you. Yeah, Some I'm people were asking questions, so I just started typing and answering. Yeah, are you, um, hold on one second, Carla.
All right. Gladstone is here. Oh, well, Gladstone, you missed my photos, but I, I, I put them in for you. <laughs> no, he was there, but he was not logged in as himself. But anyway, oh. he's there now. Um, all right. Uh, you hear me now? We're good. Okay. Um, so, Solo, let me... Yeah. Um, hold on. Yeah, so you should be able to just click on share screen and um, fire up your presentation. I guess not. Or if anything, I can run the presentation for you. Share anyway. screen, right? Share screen is on green. Yeah. And I have your presentation open already. You have it open? Okay, so I'm gonna share a screen. Hey, there we go. Good. All right, so you can press start your presentation. We're ready to rock and roll, mate. All right, hearing me okay, I'm on? Yeah, we're hearing you okay. So, okay, All so right. let me just introduce you. This is the one and only Gladstone Solomon. I think I, I can I can safely say he's the 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 Muhammad Ali of, ah. of Keeping in the Caribbean, or the Godfather of, of the Godfather of beekeeping in the Caribbean, um, past chairman of the Association of Caribbean Beekeepers, um, past president of the Trin Trin Tobago Apicultural Society. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to allow Mr. Solomon to share his presentation on Trinidad and Tobago's participation in a national honey show, London, and it's quite an adventure. And he says there's some surprises in there for me. So, let, <laughs> let, let hey, me... yeah, man, it's, it's great to be on. Uh, special right. great to you, Carla. Uh, thanks for setting the stage, breaking the ice. Jennifer did yesterday to all the Caribbean listeners, viewers. It's a pleasure to, you know, Share some some time with you, some some moments with you. All right, so we have been in the show for some time, and I'm going to just run through a couple of slides here. Just a little background about the National Honey Show. It's considered the UK's premium honey show. International classes, um, quite a bit. They have a lecture, convention, and workshop. It's held every year, the end of October, so you can you know, set, set your calendar by that somewhere in the London area. The show goes back to 1923. Um, the latest schedule I have, which is the 2019 schedule indicates that there were 346 classes. It's quite a lot. Uh, the last year's show about well, COVID and so on was a virtual event and it still attracted about 4,500 pre-registered persons. And this year's show, well, it's too early to say what it would be, virtual or what, but it started again for October, and this would be the 90th staging of the show. And that's by way of background. One more slide to give you a little more depth in it. Their mission is simply to encourage and promote beekeeping by showcasing, showcasing honey and related products through the medium of national and international competitive classes. And we'll see as we go through the, the um, growth and expansion of the show. All right, so my own advent into the show, I'm, I'm showing up a pity of, I can call him my UK beekeeping mentor. He's a Mr. Michael Duggan from Red Hill, Surrey. And this is the gentleman who I'm crediting with our participation in the show. Uh, he used to visit Tobago, at least he visited on two occasions before our first entry, um, collecting pollen and honey samples, which he would send to some university in Germany. He's an engineer by profession. Um, and well, over the years, he's been, let's say, impressed with our honey and he thought, on a second visit that, you know, he would in his own way select what he thought was the best honey and take it up to the show. So he did. He took honey from a gentleman by the name of Timothy Mentor. And guess what? That honey won a silver medal, second place 
<laughs> in category two, which you know, as you'll appreciate later on, is one of the key competitive classes. And this is where my surprise for Richard comes in. So I'm just showing the guy, hey, I've got a stack of letters. In those days, for you modern folks with internet and WhatsApp, you used to write letters. And it used, look at the date of this letter, 18th of November, 1987. So it would take, you know, slow mail. So I'm just establishing his address and the date of the letter. And um, this is interesting. I highlighted it because I wanted Richard to be able to read this, you know, and I'm going to help you read it. As you probably learned, and that's from the same letter um, that I, I showed before. And this is the, later on in the letter. This was written November the 18th, 1987. And on page two, he's telling me, as you probably learned, I entered Timothy's Mentor Honey in class two at the National Honey Show. Also, some of J.D. Anthony's honey from St. Lucia. Richard, that's Oh, I know who. I know who, man. I know who. I know who. Donald Anthony. Donald. Donald. Probably Donald Anthony. Yes. Right. So I was telling Richard yesterday that they had an entry in the Honey Show way back in 87. So yes, that's, yes. That's my bumpy, Richard. Um, please, <laughs> please share the information with Anthony. I shall. Yes. He might be logged on. Let me see. Let me see <laughs> if he's actually logged on. He was logged on yesterday. All right. Well, I, I, I hope he is. So um, again, I'm going back to, I'm establishing proof here. Another part of the letter, which was written weeks after the show in 87. Um, so he's telling me that it won second place and the silver medal must enter next time. There is tremendous competition from many places, but at least we know Tobago's honey can compete with the world. Come on, with. And he says the High Commission, the High Commission was over the moon. The High Commissioner, that should be, and came in person with his wife, and the honey was bought and put on show at our high commission. You see the kind of attachment um, in the UK that our diplomats attach to, to such events. So that was our first entry in the Honey Show and it won a silver medal in class two. It was a big media event, you know. He wins award that- Gladstone, like I think you've picked the interest of Mr. Romulus. He's got his hand up. So let me, let me, um, and right. Mr. Romulus, please, uh, unmute your mic and let's hear your comments. No, 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 no. Uh, Richard, that was uh, a little early on. I'll, I'll comment uh, uh, later, please. All right. So I established that Mr. Duggan in this note, he, has he extended an inv invitation to me to participate, and I in turn extended it to be keepers in both Trinidad and Tobago. And that basically is the background. So that we participated every year except 1993. I don't know what happened that year, can't recall. But from 1987 to the year 2000, we participated. And um, later on, I'll tell you what happened in 2000 that stopped us from participating. But I served as the, I served as the national coordinator for the show in terms of organizing. And again, I'll like elaborate on that later. But I'm, I want to share with you here, this article, Beekeeper and Trinidad and Tobago, it's published in the National Honey Show schedule, you know, a, a document that looks like this. So it's published, it's published in there, I actually have the, the original one here. I don't want Richard Doughton here, see, so I'm showing him everything. <laughs> and there's an interesting paragraph or highlight in it that um, I'm going to, you know, establish in the background, just read through quickly. So the article says, readers may notice the 35 entries in class two last year from Trinidad and Tobago. Many in rather unusually shaped jazz. Um, the exhibitors had many problems. What honey should they select? For locally, the most popular honey is dark 
and must cut our throats. We want to feel in the Caribbean. <clears throat> if you ain't, when you taste honey, if you don't feel a little thing in your throat, you, that ain't no real honey. To a European palate, the light, beautiful, flavored citrus or glory cedar honey is in a world class second to none, a difference of perception, perhaps. And so he says the main flow is from February to March with ambient temperatures in the low 80s, but the national honey show is late in October. And we're touching at some problems here. So how to prevent crystallization, which may hardly seem, let alone the effects of, um, yeah, which may have hardly seen, yet alone the effects of balance changes in pressure and temperature during a 4,000 mile flight, you know, plane going up to the 7,000 miles or something like that, touching down. Um, the honey is going through some kind of shock treatment. Uh, he also figured out that the, the glass jars were produced locally. And these are from our entry. So you get in real life or documented um, experiences. But the manufacturers never worry about thermal frosting, irregular shape, or bubbles in the glass. Above all, the lack of filtering material he felt was a problem. He experienced um, Tight and fine muslin do not exist. This is what they used to strain up there. And he, he noted that one exhibitor uh, used a finely weaved shirt to filter his honey, the extent that we go to. <laughs> and yet at least four of those exhibits, notwithstanding those, chal those challenges, he found were perfect in clarity. Nevertheless, the enthusiasm was great. The challenge was accepted and Trinidad and Tobago Beekeepers Association. We arranged some teachings and some displays. We held a national exhibition in San Fernando in March 89. And from there, the Better Honeys went to the honey show uh, later that year. The honey competent right was sent to London. With experiences, this is conclusion, better equipment and official support we may su be surprised by the new challenges appearing in class one and class two um, from the 423 beekeepers in these beautiful islands. So um, a early, uh, early layout, and let, let's talk about some of, the, some of the arrangements that we put in place. Uh, I'm showing this picture because on the left of the screen, you're seeing BWIA, some of you folks may not be familiar with that, the good old BWE, British West Indian Airways. Um, Mr. Duggan was a sort of go-getter, so he pulled me into BWIA with him. And we went and have, had a chat with them and uh, got them to agree to transport honey from Trinidad and Tobago, UK, free of course, right? In exchange, they got a free advertisement in the schedule. And even at the, at the conference venue, we had a big banner placed there. Um, but that was not all. We further involved our high commission because once the honey touched down in the UK, it had to be collected. And the high commissioner's vehicle were driving using the diplomatic channels, collect the honey take it to the high commission where it would be stored in a, in a warmish room. Um, and we tried to do this at least two weeks before the show so that the, the shock effect of the, of the transportation um, would be minimized and the honey would be sort of back to its normal self. We even at, um, after several years got the airlines to agree to offer a discounted fear for one person to go to the honey show itself. And usually we were able to arrange for that person to serve as a judge's steward, an assistant to the judge to, to witness the experience. So I'm gonna show you one person who in fact served as, as a judge's steward, my good self in 94. Who's that guy? <laughs> your, your twin brother? <laughs> Yeah, man, I, I can't, can't remember this guy, but he looks familiar. <laughs> Note class two there. So a lot of these entries, a fair amount of them would have been TNT and, um, entries. And you know, the whole experience of being a steward 
um, you know, I, I could have identified so clearly with what Carla was saying and, and Jennifer the day before. This is high class competition. One here out of place and that's the difference. One air bubble in your honey and that's the difference between first and second. You know, so the underscoring of the meticulousness that's involved in showing um, cannot be underestimated. Winning honey shows is a career for several beekeepers in the UK. I mean, they, they have perfected the art. Um, so for us to, you know, make this other breakthroughs that we did, I don't want to discredit our own efforts, but I, I'm going to say perhaps the quality of our honey, um, rather than our skill and, and depth in preparation, may have been the deciding factor. So the associations um, kicked in. Once BV agreed to provide a discounted fear, we would, state support was slow in coming, but through the associations, both in Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, um, you know the next in line to make the trip, um, if they had family up there or, if, or they were able to otherwise arrange accommodation, then um, that would have assisted. And we usually, once we got them to the UK, tied in a technical visit. So you go to um, foundation making place, you go to the Central Science Laboratory. We tie on a little two or three day technical visit with it. And this transpired uh, mainly through the 90s. So it was, it was a learning exercise. I uh, can underscore that the staff from the High Commission were particularly helpful. And Mr. Romulus, you, you probably could um, appreciate what I'm gonna say. You know that the others can't, but my understanding is that there was keen rivalry among the Caribbean diplomatic corps in the UK. So that our high commissioner got a little advantage in, um, in terms of the kind of successes that his country countrymen were experiencing in the UK, you know, when they're having, they're having the little sessions. So that the High Commission and the staff were keen to participate. And um, let, me, let me slip into that the categories that are open to the world, the ones that we are in, able to enter, um, it's considered a gift class. So your honey becomes the property of the show. And that honey is sold at the end of the show. And there is a lineup, there is a booking, there is a rush by staff and others to get Caribbean honey. I checked the 1919 schedule and honey and gift class is sold for eight pounds a jar, a one pound jar. Pretty good price. <laughs> um, so over the years we've had the the collaboration with the show organizers was, I think, extremely, extremely great. They would have facilitated um, our participation, and strategically so, um, sometimes with coercion to in, by inviting a high commissioner to officiate either the opening or the closing ceremony. So between, the, between 87 and 2000, um, three, on three occasions, different high commissioners were invited to the opening ceremony to declare the show open. I'll, I'll just call their names. Uh, Ulrich Cross, I think, was the first in 1992. Then there was uh, Commissioner Mervyn, Mr. Mervyn Assam. And there was uh, Miss, I think her first name was Sheila, I could be wrong, De Asuna. Don't get the document to correct a name, spelling, pronunciation. Um, and it's all recorded in the schedule. And I'm going to slip in that um, recently, uh, I think 2017 or so, in an attempt to re-enter the show, we um, were able to um, arrange an inverted commas because these are the sort of strategic interventions um, for the then High Commissioner of London, who, who is from Tobago and who knows me as a beekeeper and who I was able to persuade while, before he took up his appointment 
Now, when you get to the UK, I'm going to try and connect you, if I could, to the show people because we want to be able to re-enter the show and so on. And so he was very keen. And um, he, in fact, issued awards to show participants um, 2017, I believe, or, or, or 2018. Right, so I indicated that we entered the show, we, we stopped and or were able to enter the show after the year 2000. By then we were up to 76 cases at 12 bottles each, which was 72 bottles of honey would have been transported to the UK. Um, and from it, as I mentioned, the, the show organizers would have generated some revenue from the sale of the honey. So after a while, the economic considerations perhaps played in the, they saw us as being, you know, keen competitors adding um, some international perspective to the show and so on. And so that collaboration between the show organizers, the high commission and the beekeepers grew stronger. However, the European Union regulations kicked in and um, those regulations required all honeys to the EU from what they call third countries had to have a residue monitoring plan. You had to be able to verify that you had no heavy metals, that your honey wasn't contaminated. You had the facilities in place to guard against that. And if you weren't able to meet, meet those requirements, your honeys could not enter the UK, at least in the volumes that we were sending. If you were taking um, maybe two bottles, two kilos for personal use, then that was okay. So in fact, I was in the UK in 2001. I got up there before only to find out that the honey show people were informed the, the honey was about to leave Trinidad um, a bit late that it couldn't come again because those regulations kicked in. So we, our participation in the show ended informally at that time. But over the 14-year over the period, we did, we did quite well. Um, I'm gonna just stick in one little uh, aspect here about my own involvement. Um, I mean, this is indicating that I'm a, I'm a life member of the Honey Show. It was a gift. The entry fee or the membership fee was paid by uh, Mr. Michael Duggan. So, um, and this was done in 1990. The course then, if I to 200 years, then I'll be a member of the Honey Show right through. The course then was 24 pounds. So from the 19, from the, sorry, the 2019 schedule, I'm just underscoring the price of membership of one only payment of 300 pounds. If you want to be a life member, that's what it would cost you. So Rich, maybe if you join now, 20 years down the road, this membership may be valued 3,000 pounds. I wonder if it's transferable. <laughs> Maybe you could trans, you could put it in your will that you transfer your lifetime membership to the National Honey Show to me. <laughs> I don't think they would buy that. I don't think they would buy that. But you know, <laughs> would have been quite a lot. You see, and it entitles you to free membership, free entry. You know, it's you have a badge to sort of walk walk into the gates every time. So let's let's look at some of the stuff that we actually won. And, you know, I have a chart here that I, I prepared and it shows the years, the class, Trinidad and Tobago and the, and the awards, right? So um, the first year, of course, would be 1987, we entered class two. Uh, Gladstone, quick yeah. one thing. Um, the participants are asking that you do your presentation in presentation mode so they can have the full, enjoy the full scope of the, the, the graphics in the full scope of the screen. Is that workable for you? Yeah, sorry, I'm not too sure how, um, oh, so that I just go on PowerPoint? Yeah, the, yeah or yeah, the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see like a, 
like a um, an easel kind of thing, like a start presentation. All right. This is where I have to admit that I'm a sort of dinosaur when coming to these technologies. Or you can go to view up on top. If you yeah. hit view and then reading view. There you go. All right. I think I need to go back to. At the top of the screen between review and help, there's a button that's marked view. Up, 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 bring the mouse up to your left. I'm on mute, file, home, design, animate. Go along, go along, go along. An ultimate one, view. Sorry, I'm stumbling here. After review, the word review, there is view. All right, I think I need to go, if I go on the Zoom. Yeah, with this. All right, Solo, just go as you are, my brother, go as you are. Go, go as you are. Just have been revealed, but no problem. Um, yeah. Um, maybe I can remote control your computer from here. Let me see if I can remote control your computer. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Um, I'm gonna real quick remote control. Just let me take control of your computer and I'll do it for you. Look at your screen, something came up? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So, view. Yeah, because I don't have. Uh, let me see if I'm any better. Uh, well, if I can just get to the bottom of your screen, that would be ideal for me. Uh, slideshow. All right, you have control, so. From current slide. There you go. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that's what the people want. Yeah, man, right. We got to give the people what the people want, you know. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to return. I'm going to give you back control of the computer. All right. So yours now. All right. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks a lot. No problem, sir. Yeah, we see in the class, and um, I'm, I'm going to point out that for the years, and I, I, I got, you know, all these are, are scheduled for the various on issue going back to 89 um, or 88 or something like that. In those years, there was just, as far as um, international participation, the number of classes uh, were, were quite reduced. So the applicable class for us in the Caribbean was class two. Um, and that went, I think, yeah, somewhere around 94, 95, when they introduced another class, 1A, so we'll be able to, you know, just, just in one instance, I can perhaps read out what is the requirement of a class. So, yeah, I'll find it here. Cool. Yeah, this, this is a good one. Um, so this is the 1989 schedule. And, you know, you, you perhaps just seen the limited number right to the top there for international. So the class two is a class open to the British Commonwealth and the Republic of Ireland. There's no entry fee, meaning it's a gift class. So that class comprised three jars of honey, any one color, or naturally crystallized. Uh, rule seven doesn't apply. Rule seven requires that it be in a special class. And the first prize is the Hender Cup and a silver medal and 15 pounds. The second prize was a silver medal and 10 pounds. The third prize, a bronze medal and seven pounds. Right? The, the top not class back then, and I think it still is now, is a class open to the world. I'll give you an insight into this. It's 24 jars of honey. Uh, the exhibit may contain, may, sorry, consist of honey of one, two, three, or four kinds. 
All exhibits will be staged by the committee or the steward. And the first prize is the, the Hemlin Cup and so on, right? But that's, that's the big class, the, the big boy, real heavyweight class, 24 jars of honey comprising an entry. Um, as the years moved by in the fifth, in the, by the mid nineties, they added um, one A and we were able to do well on that. So let's talk about the awards and have them classified by, by island. So you see we won the, this is Tobago, um, the silver in 87, 8C is high commendation, C is commendation and like a V, 8C is a very high commendation. So you have, let's say the classical gold, silver and bronze, and then the fourth place would be very high commendation, high commendation, fifth and commendation, sixth. So that, that explains, I think I have it in the, in the bottom here, right? That explains the, the chart. Um, so you note that we perhaps ironically maybe started to do not as well in class two or, or perhaps do better in these new classes. Um, I think the, quite frankly, the competition was slightly less in the one A and the one and the three A, you know, everybody goes for class two because of the three jazz and its openness. So this is the breakdown. Um, what stands out, and this is Trinidad. Uh, in 1999, we won the Henda Cup and a silver medal. This is first prize. This Henda Cup is a much sought after. Um, what happened? I need to go back a bit. Wow. The press, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, um, very prestigious Hender Cup. A, a nice bit of anecdotal information. 1999 was the first time that somebody from outside the, the Britain won this cup. Um, and they, in fact, allow you to keep the cup until the next year, the next show. It's insured and all of that. So the cup was won by Trinidad that had to come to the Caribbean and it created a big hoorah, we can't send the cup out, da, 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 da. Eventually, eventually they had to they ensure the cup, allow the high commission um, to keep responsibility for it. Right, and our fellow, my fellow follower present uh, um, would have done just as well. So let's go to 2000. And note what happened. We won the cup again. Trinidad. The name of the beekeeper who won it. Um, I need his name is Hingson. Uh, Kirk Hingson, I think, was the beekeeper, but I think the entry was in his wife's name. So there's some little delicate something, and I apologize in advance if I have it wrong, but you know what? Could fine tuned. But look what happened in 2000. Not only did we win the Henda Cup, we literally swept class two. All we didn't win was the bronze medal, right? We came first, no, I'm saying it wrong. Yeah, once you win the Henda Cup, you get a silver medal. So we didn't get the second or the third, but we got a very high commendation. We got four out of the six awards. This is Trinidad and, um, Tobago got the bronze medal. So we literally swept the awards barring the silver medal. And just in summary, when we look at the numbers, we, we won a total of 58 awards in a 13 year period. Um, little, Tobago, little Tobago, you know, we have our little inter Trinidad Tobago rivalry, friendly rivalry. <laughs> keeps the competition keen. I mean, we outdid them. But see, of course. <laughs> but you, but Tobago's never won the cup, man. So, you know, you- We're gonna get back there, you, you have to bring that up. <laughs> we never won the cup. <laughs> we never. So, Trinidad won the cup twice. They got the big, the big prize twice. They got it twice. And yeah. the, plan was, the plan was to win it again in 2001. Yes. Yeah, the EU regulations kicked in. Yes. They were not challenged up three years straight. 
then mm -hmm. consciousness the cup is yours. Right, so, right, right. Uh, so they did that on purpose, man. That was a that was a plot. <laughs> but maybe the gods in the European Union conspired. They anticipated our success. Uh huh. So, yeah, I mean, the guys were. We were all, as Obama says, fired up and ready to go with this honey show. You know, and right, right, right. It was keen, as you see from the accelerated. That's the end here. Um, but I myself made my own contribution to awards. You know, I take a little thing here. Note, um, in where year was this boy? Oh, sorry. Yeah, in 2000, so I won that bronze medal in 2000. And right, class, right. Oh, this is a class two. And um, uh, I won a high commendation. I'm not seeing the, uh, it's somewhere in the back here. 91. Right, 91, right. I'm going to talk about this just now. And in 97, right? So we have quite a couple of persons on the island who would have won awards um, and who would have understood the requirements of entering the show. So we see this petio propping up. And these honeys, I didn't, I said, we are keepers. We know the ins and outs of the industries. I'm not going to butter these up. These jars have not been opened for over two decades. Stuff <laughs> going on three decades. That star, when you see it on your bottle, um, you know, that's a ribbon, that's your award. Good, 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 good. We seen a little remnant here of the, the, the entry. I guess it was down here, somewhere down here. Right. And it migrated. Okay. So, hey, these things are it's just on a shelf. I don't touch it. You know, I, it, it's just there. I just picked it up. And, and if you want to know what would happen to honey after, it's in a dark area. It's just out in the open. No special protection. What I think is noticeable, um, maybe it has happened, and, but you're not seeing signs of granulation, crystallization. I've had others and you would have seen creeping crystallization. These, and, and I believe these were, were honeys, but they have not, they have not um, crystallized. So forgive the messy look, but as I said, you know, I'm showing a bit of the good and the bad. Um, and this was a, a collection of the range of honeys in Trinidad and Tobago that um, I put together. I went to um, a <coughs> party, party in the UK. So I asked beekeepers from throughout the two islands, you know, to send me samples. And um, this was the, the, the lightest, lightest, I think it's, it's the Recedia. Right, right, yeah, Glory Cedar. Yeah. And um, I'm not too sure, uh, um, more, more, plus, no, uh, I won't tell you. We make wine from it. Um, so I thought I'll cover up that last picture with this, you know. Um, we had a honey tasting table up there and we had people taste the honey and comment on it. Great. So um, I'm, I'm sort of just there in terms of my presentation. There's time for questions. But let me, let me just show you. I made some notes here that I, I want to table. Richard, in terms of the December show, and for those who are interested, my advice to you is to start to select your honey from now. Don't wait till May because the best honey may have gone. You're going to be into the dry season. April is probably our driest month. Moisture content would be lowest. And let me underscore uh, Carla's point and Richard's point about um, moisture content. Um, to do well, our honeys that would have done well we're usually in this in the 17, 17 and a half. Um, not too sure. We I think maybe in one instance uh, we, we dipped below that. Hey, you gotta bear with me. I must revisit a slide here and identify the person who won the silver medal. This was Timothy Mentor, and we had a female woman beekeeper. Margaret Keynes Dumas, 
Hope she's listening. <laughs> silver here. She wants silver here. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Margaret, I've given you a big... I yeah, didn't forget, I was trying to get a picture from her. Um, so I'll just underscoring some points. From, from observations as a judge's steward, um, I, I endorse, you know, what is said, the judges don't use instruments, you know, this is refractometer. They don't use it on the show. You put a drop of honey here and look through and it will tell you, it will tell you the content if you pull it against the light. They use the rods um, as, the, as the judges steward, you are not allowed to advise the judges, of course, see anything you 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 know you just to assist them um take the honey as the, from the entrance at the entry point stage it from the stand if the judges need your support and opening a bottle he or she would open it and it's also a training opportunity so the judges think aloud deliberately so that you as the steward would understand you know the processes that that they're going through and we've had um, maybe 10 or 12 beekeepers in Trinidad and Tobago who, who've had the benefit of that exposure. But I'm going to throw the issue, um, the, the general question of whether a good light honey or a good dark honey is better, you know. Um, interesting discussion. Uh, I've seen We've had some challenges and what we, what we did, not when I say we, this was encouraged by Michael Duggan, who had a very broad international scope. He would travel all over the world. Um, judges for a local honey may be generally more familiar with honey from that locality. So that if this honey comes in and the flavor is not appealing to them, it's new to them, um, there's, a, there's a measure, and this is my observation from me, um, there's a measure of informed subjectivity beyond the, the um, objective factors like cleanliness and viscosity and so on. Once it comes to aroma and taste, um, you know, it's, it's the judge's call. For some reason, a judge may like Flavor of this honey. Um, another judge may prefer the flavor of this one. But I often ask myself, if in a judge's mind, both are equal in every respect except the color, which one would usually get the nod? And from asking the questions, I think the lighter one tends to get the nod. I'm not sure, um, you know, what's behind it, but it's it's perhaps just um, a fact of life. So I thought I'd show that out. And um, I think that's it. Okay, Gladstone, great presentation, man. I love the history, man. I love the history, I love the history. Um, yeah. Definitely you're one of, of the Caribbean's true ambassadors of apiculture. Um, and I think you helped Trinidad go to places um, that they wouldn't have necessarily got without your personal um, investment of time, blood, sweat, and tears. So, I mean, you know, the contribution to apiculture in Trinidad and Tobago, um, you know, is probably second to none. And I think, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why I thought that you, we're talking about honey shows. Yeah. It was important that we embraced two of the Caribbean's best, um, you know, Gladstone Solomon and Dr. Valma Jessamy, although we have not been able to raise Dr. Jessamy yet, so your head may still be on the block. <laughs> let, 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 me add, let me add something. Let me, let me, of course, we have been, there, there have been efforts in the past, in the recent past, maybe three or four years uh, to get back in the show, and it was remiss of me not, not to include that. Um, so, I mentioned that our new high commissioner, you know, we, we, because he was from Tobago and sort of knew him, was able to brief him and put him in connection with the show. And we tried to work out some modality, quite honestly, and this has been very open around the EU regulations, you know. The show people were very keen on having us 
back and we, we've enjoyed the benefit of, of being there. The publicity, you know, people say, I hear you're the best honey in the world. Well, of course, you know, um, no, that's, that's not bad advertisement. It may not be totally factual. So there are discussions and approaches were made to our Minister of Foreign Affairs. This was in the last couple of years to see whether anything was possible via diplomatic channels in terms of getting our honey up there. And we got a nicely worded letter back from the Minister of Foreign Affairs after investigations saying um, that they had to be very strict in you know, observing um, protocols. So as much as they you know, saw merit in the idea, um, there was no way that they could have participated. Uh, but we've had, um, and I'm sure Debbie wouldn't mind me calling her name, and Corky Degans, and um, Debbie's brother, his name, lose me, newish but keen beekeepers, they actually um, made their way to London, took their honey up, and entered the show. This is in the last two, three years, and I understand that others would have done that. So you can take honey into the UK and they, oh, I have a letter from the High Commissioner telling us the, their custom requirements. I think it's up to two kilos um, for personal use. You're required to declare it, of course. Maybe if you have two and a half bottles, the guy may let it through. Um, so we had persons who took their honey into the show. The thing with doing that though is the, the trauma that the honey experiences um, as, as both Carla and Jennifer, your honey has to be settled so you can't reach up the day before the show and if the honey got a good shaking up by the baggage handlers or whatever, um, and it, it needs some time to settle, you may be disadvantaged, but I know others would have transcended that. I think the next speaker would tell her own story about that. So yeah, that's, it's, it's a key intro. Um, if there is any way, as, as uh, Carla said it, you've got to be in it to feel it, to know it. So I urge all our listeners, especially those from the Caribbean, to select your best honeys from now. Start to observe. When you have a sting, put it aside. Don't spin it in your extractor. Crush it. Let it drip out. Keep the aroma. The aroma is a big part. When the judges crack that cover, if they get a good whiff and something hits them, hey, you know, you have a good chance. All right. That's it, Rich. That's All right, it. Gladstone. Um, Shucks, I had a question for you. It's, it, it, it escapes me at this point. Um, but I've got a few people with their hands up. Um, uh, Jasha. Jashaka, Andrew, um, if you just unmute your mic, sorry for the pronunciation of your name if I got it wrong. Um, Jashaka, Andrew, if you unmute your mic, you can ask your question. Go ahead, please. Hi, hi, hi. Sorry about that. I didn't have any questions yet. Okay, cool. No problem. All right. That's not a problem. These things happen. Um, let's see. I've got some questions in the chat. Uh, wow, there's a lot of questions in the chat. Um, let's start. Okay, let's get start with Michael Fontenelle. Michael, um, unmute your mic and ask your question, sir. Uh, Richard, is that, I wanted to ask about two things. Go ahead. Yeah, with me. One, um, that very dark honey in the display that 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 um. So Solomon showed. I wanted to know what's behind that. Is what what trees in particular, what plants would would give you that that dark? I can help you. Jamu, I think it's Jamu. It just came back to me. Okay. You know I that mean, tree going up on the, on is, the that, is, that, is that is that something that's unique to to your particular location? I mean, no, because it's, it's, because of my yeah, reading, has yeah, my reading has suggested that some other parts of the world are are marketing their unique qualities, like New Zealand and so forth, um, and getting quite a price for their quality of honey. Oh, Manuka. Um, right. I don't know. My, my screen. And, and I mean, I, it just, I just struck me as very interesting. That's the first part. The second yeah. thing I wanted to ask was regards to the protocols that you see um, frustrated your efforts to participate in 2000. Yeah. Um, heavy metals. This sounds to me like health and, health and safety issues. If heavy metals and things like that, I just wondered what, have we, what can be done at our level to ensure that we are meeting those standards? 
Well, it's a general regulation that's applicable throughout the European Union to all imports from what they call state countries. Um, no, no. Like, yeah. So no, I, I know that you keep saying it's a European standard, but yeah. when you explained it and you said that it was it was it was with regards to the presence of heavy metals and stuff like yeah. that. Michael, let me help. Something of interest. Yeah, Michael, right. let me help Gladstone a little bit in our answer. Um, the what is what Gladstone is referring to is that the European Union instituted a requirement of all third party countries to have in place what is called a residual mineral, residual monitoring plan, which is a, a government to government agreement. So there's a, a strategy that is put in place between the government, the European Union, and the government of Saint Lucia or the government of Trinidad oh. and so forth. Uh, what happened is that. Most of our Caribbean islands, except for um, Jamaica and I think uh, Jamaica and Cuba, yeah. missed the boat on executing, putting in place a residual monitoring plan. So by virtue of this, most of our islands are now barred from direct commercial importing of honey to the European Union. However, this being said, now that Brexit has occurred and the UK is no longer a part of the European Union. Um, well, well, Richard, for me and you, the European Union is next door, eh? Yeah, but it doesn't matter. The, 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 the European, yeah, well, yeah, Martinique, yes. Yes. Um, in that regards, but, and that's one of the reasons why we are no longer able to, pre previously a lot of our honey from St. Lucia went to Martinique, and mm. that's no longer the case because it's barred from entering the, entering the country yeah. Due to the same protocols. That, that, that was why I was, I was concerned because it's next door. Yes, but I'm more concerned. Well, from the pers from the uh, from the objective of entering your honey into the competition easily um, mm -hmm. in the UK, um, that would now that hopefully that barrier uh, may have disappeared, or it, or the, the rules and regulations will become less stringent. So I mean, let's see how the next few uh, how things pad out um, with that regards. Um, and so forth. So, but that's, I think that hopefully should answer your question, um, Michael, um, Michael. But I need to give you a call a little later on today, Michael, because I have, yes, we have on, on, I'm working on, we have on I, I, need some, I need your input or as to as to location. Um, remember mm -hmm. that same project uh, a few months, last two years ago? When well, you call me. The community. You'll call me. I'll call you, good. Yeah. All, right. All right, my brother. Okay, um, so let's move on. There's some other persons that want to make a contribution in the group. So we've dealt with Michael, Arisa. Yeah, Arisa, our good friend Arisa. I think, but I think Michael may have touched on that, but I'll still bring Arisa back up online because she always has a valuable contribution to make. Um, Arisa, if you want to unmute and make a contribution, please. Um, which question are you referring to? Richard? Well, you've got so many. You've got so many. Reasons. So and I, you pick, caught me, pick, you pick caught one me in the hat. question as well. <coughs> pick um, one in the hat and ask the questions. Uh, um, yes, I was curious about the variation in color. What would um, cause the light color as well as the dark color if, if Gladstone <laughs> remembers, you know, the nectar sources? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's a sort of standard application. The, the general characteristics of the, the honey um, is transferred from the, from the flower and the nectar. Um, so that this, these are, you know, broad brush perspectives. A lighter color honey um, is usually from a flower that has light color and the nectar is, is light. So if you know the jamu, <coughs> fruit, uh, if you're based in Trini, going up on the highway opposite um, Trin City where there are some tall trees there, um, there are a lot of jamun trees there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in Tobago and parts of Trinidad, there's a, a fair amount of, of, of where we see there. Um, and also they, they wax itself to some extent if it's virgin wax. Um, Compared to old wax, there could be some slight transfer yes. of colors, but you know, taste, viscosity, general characteristics. Um, and because you know, we have such a wide multi floral mix, mm -hmm. some people may be able to tell you that this may have a little, this a variety has a little more more in it or something like that. Some tastes are much more distinctive than others. Right. 
and yeah. Oops. What happened there? For those who know Featherwood, um, which flowers at the onset of the rain season, but it, it's Richard made the point has a very high moisture content. Um, but to me, um, I think there may be some medicinal value because the, the bush um, has traditionally, it's a deep tradition being used to cure the worst colds, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, so maybe there is something inside there with some extraction, but what we lacking in severely is, um, you know, disorder laboratory work, disorder analysis. We may have our own version of the Mon um, New Zealand Manuka honey and, 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 and our Correct. own honey Correct. here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. I hope that answers your questions, Risha. Um, you know, just to add on to uh, what Gladstone said, that uh, the laboratory work is something that um, is deeply lacking in the Caribbean, um, in, I mean, unable to get some of the analysis. But to our credit, um, University of the West Indies, um, St. Augustine campus, um, the team there, Mr. Um, Dr. Um, Azad. Mohammed, yeah, Azad Mohammed, I think. Yeah. Azad Mohammed and so forth are doing some great work. And, you know, we are working on the situation, you know, hopefully in the near future, um, there'll be that, that laboratory be able to examine honeys from the region, despite the regulations that there are concerning importation of honey. But I think there'll be some kind of a, a dispensation of what it afforded to the university to allow them to, you know, build their reputation and their testing capacity and also build a pollen, po pollen profile for the entire Caribbean. Yep. So if it can't happen in Trinidad, well, it will happen somewhere else, but it will happen as the people yep. say. Um, you know, so it's one of those things that we really need to focus on. If, if and one of the things that our industry, apiculture, uh, we've, we've, although we've achieved much, we could achieve so much more if we were to embrace the science um, into our, our sector and really get the scientists involved to, to help us understand our products better so that we could zoom in now in our husbandry and zoom in on what's our, our forage and what's happening out there. I mean, just for example, if I want to get a viral load analysis of the bees in St. Lucia, there is no way I can get that information. I would need to take my bees, set a portion in some and a vial um, in some alcohol or and, and send it up to um you know free or freeze them and send them up to uh, uh, Florida or um you know one of these universities and get the analysis done where we we have facilities and you know, we have to develop these facilities within our region to support us to allow our industry to grow. Our own, only way our industry can grow is from within. It can't grow from external sources. We need to have the technology, the scientists, um, the beekeepers, and all the things that go with that within our sector. And I think the development of a, a regional or national the honey show, which we're trying to pull off, will help elevate the overall apicultural um, environment across the region. Um, and I think that's what we aim to do through the assistance of Jeff SGP and other agencies and to really make this an industry. So the, the, the science and the craft that I need to mesh and they need to develop simultaneously together. Um, sorry for talking for so long. Uh, oh, well said, Richard. Well said. <laughs> you know? We have we have a contribution. We're still waiting for Dr. Jessamy, otherwise your head's gonna roll. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying nothing. Um, so, Richard, does that answer your questions, or do you have any more to ask, Miss Allen? Uh, so far, I was just checking. Right. So. Um, well, I guess, yeah, that will probably cover my question on if this door was completely closed for this re residual monitoring plan. And if we're only looking to send honey to the UK, indeed, that's where the honey show is. Yes. But, um, you know, um, there are other countries. Yes. Right. Are there restrictions to the US and... Um, yeah, 
there are similar restrictions to the US, but they're not as um as as uh, as um pronounced as the yeah. as the U Europe European Union. But the the America is a different kettle of fish. But yep. I think you, you should it should not be as stringent as the European Union. But I could be wrong. Don't quote me. All right, but we still have to focus on our Caribbean honey show first, man. So let's right. focus on <laughs> developing our own, and then once we've developed our own we can look to branch out into these other things man you know right. we charity begins at home mm -hmm. and we need to promote ourselves and then you know uh create our own vibe our own feeling within the caribbean and then from developing our own caribbean excellence we can then you know we should you know one of the things maybe we could look at and maybe mr romulus i know he's listening um that we can look at uh, developing a system where you know the the, the entrants that win, you know, we can try to use our for uh, a collective foreign offices, uh, a collective, you know, to to help us or help beekeepers get their product into the into the honey shows around the world, yep. as required. You know, so it's something, and it's a great marketing play. You know, yeah. it's a great, great thing, you know. So if we've got a, a honey from Trinidad that wins the Hender Cup, that's a great marketing ploy. There's a lot of people exactly. around the world who are into honey that will come and visit Gladstone and the, and the gang in Trinidad to, to, to uh, and taste the honey and see what's happening in Trinidad. Likewise, if St. Lucia, which we will win the Hender Cup soon. <laughs> <laughs> ah, look, Dr. Jessamy! Oh, hey. My neck is saved. <laughs> hey, man. Uh, the hero is here, man. I, I'm going to stop talking now. Um, <laughs> all right. So, Risa, I hope we've answered your questions. Um, Dr. Jessamy has joined us. Um, I know she's her time is, we, she charges by the minute, you know, or by the second. So, um, we're going we're gonna to allow her to not take up too much of her time. Um, Dr. Jessamy, no, I'm not going to introduce you. We think we've exhausted talking about you in your absence. All good things. Nothing negative, all good things. You've saved you've saved Paul Gladstone's neck because he had it on the block. <laughs> so, he never lets me down. Yeah, I'm but fantastic. <laughs> so without further ado, let's let Dr. Jessamy just recount a couple of a little of her experience, introduce herself, and just talk about some of the successes that she has had um, at the London Honey Show. Dr. Jessamy, all yours. The floor is yours. Oh. Good day. Uh, good day, Matthias. Gladstone, good to see you. Um, I'm sorry that I, I, I'm really busy. In fact, I lost track of time and had to run out from what I was doing to, 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 to keep my word, to, to share a few minutes with you. So um, I, I see that you have 93 odd participants. So participants, good day. Where are your participants from, our Brother Matthias? All around the world, all around the world. Oh, wow. Gladstone, could you end your share screen, please? All, <laughs> all right. So. They're, they're from all around the world. Um, okay. so we've got a lot of people from Trinidad, a lot of people from St. Lucia, some from mm -hmm. Jamaica, uh, from the Bahamas. I think we even have a couple of people from India. Oh, wow. So we have a, a, a very good complement of persons um, from around the world that are with us today. OK. So I do not know what you would have said before, but my bit is that a great honey starts all the way from your beekeeping practices if you if you if you don't do what is right from from the location of, of your apri from your your husbandry your, your beekeeping techniques it's it's it, it all leads to getting a good product so um, you, you can't you can't have a consistently good honey if you're not consistently doing good uh, beekeeping practices. Yes, yes. There is sufficient evidence which shows that honey is influenced by the geographic and botanic factors. And so I have been able to, guided by what's already in the literature, um, 
compare honeys from different parts of Grenada, for instance. And so we know that honeys from the mountain region is different to honeys from the, the coastal region, et cetera. There are some honeys that would always have more moisture content than others right. because of those natural factors of the type of, of, of plant, the, the botanic, or just the species, right? Um, and environmental factors, time of year, etc. So you have to take all those things into consideration in deciding which honey you're going to, you, you want to show, okay? So um, if you have a profile for um, your honey, then you would decide um, for, for instance, the honey that I produce during the rainy season has different properties and different characteristics of the honey that I would extract in the dry season. And if I want to enter a category for maybe a dark honey, then I have to choose that honey from a certain location or a certain time of year, et cetera. So it starts with understanding the, 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 the geographic botanic. Um, you may have a honey that is bitter. Yes. And it's not that it's not a good honey. There are people who actually want bitter honey. I have a bitter honey um, when I grow in a certain region, when I, I you know, put hives in a certain region and extract certain times of year, then I know I can get that really choice, um, rare bitter yeah, species actually here that does that as well in solution. Exactly, exactly. So you need to understand those factors. Also, um, the, there are times of year that um, there are things that the bees do, and you probably know more about that, where it would change the properties of, of the honey also, whether they're bringing in honeydew, et cetera. So that would change the sugar and, and whatnot in the honey. So you need to know a lot about the, the environment, the geographic, the botanic factors in selecting which honeys. If you want a very light honey, then you would have to, to do what is necessary. You put your hives in a certain location or, or, or whatever technique so you can get a light honey. Um, so it, it really starts with proper beekeeping practices. Yes, yes, yes. Then once you get your honey and you extract it, how do you handle your honey supers when you take them out from the hive? That has a lot to do with the, the, how the, the honey goes from being a really great product in the hive to post harvest. Um, some people extract in the field and put the, the frames right back. Most times when beekeepers do that, the honey is not yet fully sealed. And so the best honey should be honey that is fully ripened and sealed by the honeybees. So extracting in the field is difficult to extract sealed honey in the field, right? And that's going to cause some drop in the quality of the product also. Um, but you want to always have sealed honey that's fully sealed and ripened by the bees because it would prevent um, fermentation, etc. if your honey is ripe, okay? Uh, Post-harvest, there are people who... who um, boil the honey who pasteurize who heat you know you should not be doing that because that that changes everything it's no longer honey it's a sweet product from the bees um when when you do that honey is naturally acidic so you want to you want to look at how you handle it and what containers you store the honey in because the honey could react with the containers and that could change the color and of the chemistry of the honey also, uh, the uh, moisture content of honey should be less than 18%. If you have anything that is higher than that and you take it to show, you'd probably be disqualified before you could even enter. So you want to make sure that the honey has the right moisture content. And there are different categories. So you would 
enter categories based on the type of honey that you would have produced. One of the most difficult classes that I have um, entered and won several times is the clear class. And to, for the, the clear class, you want to make sure that your honey is well settled before you, 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 you bottle because you do not want to have any particles because the honey would be put up against a very bright beam of light and any particulate matter in there is going to be seen. So um, entering the clear class of honey is always challenging um, and, and, and one of the most difficult um, to compete in. Yeah, competing, competing in a, a class with dark honey or so, that's easy um, or easier. <laughs> but the, the real challenge, the Medal of Ukraine, which we've won many times, is for the Claire class. Fantastic. Fantastic. And uh, so clear does not necessarily mean white or light, but of course, if it's light, it will more likely be clear. Um, right? So we've had different grades of clear um, that we've entered. Of course, as I said, the thickness, the viscosity, if you handle the honey properly, then it would have a good, 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 good bouquet, good, good, good flavors. If the honey is heated, you would lose that. You would lose all those flavors and, and the bouquet of the honey. Um, air bubbles, how you extract and handle your honey would, 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 would cause air bubbles to sometimes get trapped in there. And that's a no, no, you do not want to have air bubbles um, in the honey. If the, the honey is not cleaned properly before you package it, for, for sure, then when the judge opens the jar, they would find debris on the surface of the honey and on the inside of the cover. So it's important that you, you, you clean the honey properly before you package it. Um, and of course, you must put it into a, a properly clean jar that is dry. Because if the jar is not properly dry, you've added moisture to the honey and that would affect the quality of the honey. Um, after you put your honey in the jar, it's advised not to open it until the judge opens it. <laughs> right? Because when the judge opens the jar, they tend to want to get that first aroma that comes out. And so, you know, if you leave the honey sealed after you've done all your preparation and cleaning and whatnot, and the judge opens, the first thing they want to get is that nice aroma. That is if your honey has one, because not all honeys. But if you handle the honey properly, um, more than likely it will have this really nice aroma when, when the bottle is, is opened. Um, you always want to handle your jars with clean hands so that you do not leave any fingerprints or marks on there. The first year I entered, um, I participated in the show, we got a silver award. And um, I got some feedback and uh, I entered in more than one category. One of the categories feedback was given. My hands are very dirty. <laughs> in the soil. <laughs> I had no time to, to clean up. So I came dirty out of, of the, the field and came right in. So um, the, there was a decision between the first and second place. And because my jar was smudged with like the honey print and whatnot on the outside. So I lost some points. So we got the silver award. Okay, okay. And, and so because sometimes it comes down to presentation. So presentation is important. I've seen um, honey presented in Listerine bottle and all sorts of different bottles from persons who were entering the show for the first time and did not know better. So you have to present it nicely. Um, there are some jars that are used, for instance, the UK Honey Show use a different jar to the US Honey Show. I participated in one of the shows of the American Beekeeping Federation and their standards are totally different to how honey shows are handled in, um, in the UK. So if you, based on where you're taking your honey to the rules and standards, would vary. So it's always good to just follow the rules of show, uh, but it starts from the hive. It starts with a good product and how you 
um, manage your honey, how you extract your honey, how you store the honey, and then your final packaging. It's, 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 it comes down to the panel of judges, so there could be some subjectivity in, in the whole, um, in the judging process. Um, there is some testing that is done, not, not very rigorous. Last year, not last year, 2019, Monde decided to do more testing of honeys to look for, for sugars and, and whatnot on the chemistry of the honey. So if you want to go to the International Honey Show, then expect that you have to send the honey ahead and they do very rigorous testing of the honey um, to look at sugars, to look for pesticides, to look for, uh, for residues, and so in the product. Um, uh, in, 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 depending on where you go for show, I think in, in Turkey, the last time the testing was done also. Um, and then you have all the regulatory issues of getting your honey in. Um, the process in Montreal was smoother, when we sent our honey to Turkey, it was delayed in customs for a long time before um, before um, it was cleared. Um, but um, those are some of the high points. I think um, it, it's not just what happens in the jar. You have to start thinking about good honey from from production all the way through your harvesting, your post handling how you store the honey. Yes. Um, not to knock on any particular beekeeper, but I see beekeepers putting honey in use the containers, especially the blue barrels. And those are not for food. Mm -hmm. So people should not be storing honey in, in some of these containers because honey is a food item. And the thing about honey, it takes up it has high hygroscopic properties. Hydroscopic, yes. So yes. It will take up water yes. from the environment. So if your jar is not sealed properly, if you, you extract a very good honey, and by the time you're through, your honey would no longer have the properties of a really great tasting honey. Um, the container you put the honey in could also degrade the, the, the value of the honey. So people should not be using these. Um, blue barrels and, and all of these um, containers that are not for food to store their honey. Or you could maybe put a, a, a food grade ba uh, bag liner. I know some of the UK yes, people yes. put a, bag li a plastic <laughs> bag liner inside of it and then you they the liner. A bag liner. Yes. Well, they're even, uh, I, I think, Kelly Bees and so on, many of the other um, suppliers sell the bag liners because some. Yes metal containers depending on um because I, as i as i said honey is naturally acidic yes 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 so storing in in metal could also affect the yeah, color it out the metal after one well, yes right so so the liners are recommended um if you when to use metal containers but it's best that you use food grade um and somebody just put up, please visit the National Honey Show website for more information. And that is very true. They've got a lot, they've got a lot of presentations and uh, um, stuff that, that gives you guidance for um, preparing for show. So but as I said, it's, oh, it all starts with the honey because when I make a decision to go to a show, I do my own honey show first. <laughs> and we do our little tasting. I may invite one or two persons to come and do my little honey tasting party with me, or I do it with you know my family. And um, and we 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 are usually like, yes, we got the right one this time, you know. So because um we would have, you know, entered and, and, and the results match the decision that we would have made at home. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, I think we've got a few questions. I don't know if we have, if we have a few moments for a couple of questions. Dr. Jessamy and Gladstone. I think I've got some questions in the group. Um, I'll, Stephen Howard's got his hand up. I hope he's still there. He's been, his hand is up for a long time. Stephen, could you go ahead with your question, please? Stephen, Stephen Howard. 
Well, the question is written. It says, how have entries in these competitions assisted in building an industry in Trinidad and Tobago and within the wider Caribbean? Um, yeah, well, yes, I saw the question. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, have we, I don't know. Do you think as Caribbean beekeepers, we've been able to capitalize on the successes of persons um, within our region? I think Carla just said she's got a shoot. She's shooting off, but she says thanks and she'll look forward to hearing us. But swinging back to the question, I mean, I don't think we've capitalized on it fully. I know Valma, you've done significant work and you're continuing to, your journey is always evolving and, <laughs> and you're pushing the envelope all the well, time. You see, I think it's, it's always good to win an award. Yes. But the emphasis should be on production of a good product. Yes. Because there would always be a winner. Right? Um, the year that I do not enter a competition, someone else would win. Exactly. Okay? And, um, or I may enter and I do not win. So competitions are good. Competition is, is, is important because it's about being your best, about quality, about a high standard. Yes. And so we cannot talk about the show and the award, if we do not want to go back to the field, if we do not want to go back to the apiary and talk about good practices, no pesticides, for instance, there are beekeepers who are still using all sorts of treatments in their hives for veromite, for, for what have you. You cannot be doing pesticide treatments in your colony and expect that it wouldn't affect your honey and then want to take that honey to the market. So, exactly. so it all starts with quality and producing a good product um, before you start thinking, well, I want an award, right? It takes a lot of work to get to the award. And even if you did not get to the award, what are the things you need to do to have a good product? So for instance, we've been to the Honey Show and we had persons from New Zealand who entered in the same category as we did and we won. Um, the award so that was that felt really great because you know new zealand is is regarded for for having one of the best honeys in the world but why is new zealand honey considered the best it's not because of the awards but it's because of the standard that the country has set yes for their for their industry Correct. it's because of all of the research and science that has gone into um you know building a, a, a strong industry so it's so the persons who are the biggest honey producers and sellers in the world, they are not going to the awards. They, 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 the award is more something that you may find pursued mainly by amateurs. Yes. I'm not saying that commercial beekeepers don't worry about awards because there are categories for commercial beekeepers also. But you more than likely find that Persons who have, once they cross a certain size and they have a, a, a market in an industry, they don't worry too much about the, the beekeeping awards. They more focus on quality and production. And, and uh, you're right, they are maintaining that consistent quality. Mm -hmm. There are standards of production. So, for instance, in New Zealand, they have developed the unique Manuka Factor, UMF. I have done similar work and research and testing with all honeys and we <coughs> developed our phytomed factor, which PMF, which rates our honey based on the, 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 the antibacterial and antimicrobial properties of the honey and the medicinal properties of the honey. So we have developed something that we can probably look at how we can make it a Caribbean standard where we talk about the phytomed factor. So the more properties your honey have, the more medicinal properties, the more benefits, that's really what I think we should be looking for as a Caribbean industry to focus on quality. The, the yes. awards are great, the awards are great. But I think um, if we can follow on the New Zealand model to look at, 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 at quality, we know that the, the habitat the, the, the wild plants, the, the native food source that we are dependent on as beekeepers is under threat. It's under threat from 
Of course, we have the existential threat of climate change, but from development pressures, most beekeepers are not planting trees. In, in, in New Zealand, people create farms of, yeah. of the manuka tree for their bees, and yeah. they get a secondary product, the manuka oil. So beekeeping is not by chance. The person has you know, 50 acres, 50 acres of, of, of land that is farmed, Mm -hmm. for the bees and for the, the byproducts from the, 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 the trees. Exactly. And so it's a business, it's an industry. Yes. Here, here we are, um, here we are just waiting to go out in the wild, in the bushes and expecting that nature will continue to give us a bounty and we could become big commercial fact um, beekeepers and we could have a thriving big industry but that's that's living a lot up to chance if yeah. we if we are farming with beekeeping in mind if we are farming with secondary products in mind and create a synergy between agriculture and mm. apiculture then mm. secure a vibrant high quality sector uh, the Caribbean is noted for many medicinal plants that are native to the region and we can build on that so that we we we, we go beyond the question about the award to talking about a quality product Correct. that caribbean could be noted for and even if we went to the competition and the judge didn't like the taste of your honey and you did not win an award you know that your honey is still the best honey because you have, you know, all of these other factors that, that, that make your honey great. So um, yes, it's great to win the awards, but I think as we move forward, there's a lot of interest right now and that's great. We need to talk about consolidating apiculture with serious agriculture. Yes. It does not have to, and there are different forms of agriculture. Um, if you're planting lettuce and, 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 and cabbage and whatnot, you're not, gonna, you're not planting anything for your bees. That right. I have a neighbor who has cleared his entire land. He uses, and, and we eat everything and it's clean and he's doing cash crops. Right. I'm, I'm next door and I've got over 40 acres that I've left in in, in, in wild trees, I've planted other trees, I've planted specific trees <coughs> for my apri. And his daughter decides she wants to become a beekeeper like me and she brought hives to her land. And I had to ask her, well, what are your bees feeding on? Yes, your trees. Said, you clean your <laughs> land. Yes, it's your <laughs> land. And she's like, oh, it's my land. I said, yes, it's your land, but you've cleaned it. You've cleaned it out. You're planting cash crops. You're planting lettuce, <laughs> planting cabbage. You're planting carrots. What are your bees feeding on? Uh, right? interesting. Interesting. So we have to come up with a different <laughs> model of agriculture for bees, or else or we would have a lot of hungry bees on the islands. If we're cutting down all the trees for development, <laughs> down the trees to plant food, how could we be building a vibrant apiculture sector at the same time? Yeah. Well, yeah. well, this is the problem that planners planners have. You see, a lot of institutions, a lot of government institutions, um, see apiculture as a as a new buzz thing. Um, but the coin of it, but they're not applying. No, but you can't blame government for everything. It's very uh, easy to blame the government. If the government is giving you support, yes. that's a great thing. If you have institutional support, you have technical support, you have financial support, the yes. onus is on the industry players to yes. understand the industry. Not, it's not for the government to understand the industry. The government says, let's go to apiculture. The beekeeper should be happy. What the beekeeper needs to say to the government, can I lease 50 acres of land? Mm -hmm. Oh, can I? There was a, a mm -hmm. there, there was a group that leased a, a, a farm. They leased this farm from the government, and it was over 160 acres of land. And unfortunately, they couldn't manage it, and they had to give it up. 
But, so you why, be, but my question is, Valma, sorry to interrupt you. I don't think beekeepers should be in the business of leasing land. I why think. Not? No, see, listen, listen, because there's so much economic pressures on them already. If the no, government, but if, listen, if, hold but on, listen, if, Richard, you are thinking of beekeeping as an isolated business. Beekeeping no, is not an isolated. No, it's business. not. But what I'm saying to you, no, if, no if, 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 if hold on, hold on, Let if we live in, let me give an it's example. My time, and I'm going to leave very soon. It's my time because I'm okay. <laughs> If a beekeeper does not have the resources to invest properly in his business, he's a, he would have already failed. Yes. Number one. Number two, if you can look at models of cooperation where you can bring people together where one person may not have the resources, but a, a group of people can lease 50 acres of land, Lease of agriculture land is very is very low, as opposed to lease for other purposes. Yes. You lease the land, you can keep the land in wild trees, you can plant things. There are things you can plant that within, within a year, within two years, you have a lot of food for your bees. Yes. You cannot have a vibrant bee business, apiculture business, as a nomad, the nomadic idea of doing beekeeping and being successful at it is just going to set up a lot of people, get them excited, and then they I will agree. be- I agree. I agree 100% with you, but here's my point. You have most of our islands, St. Lucia, it's 238 square miles. It's not a very big place. We have institutions within our, 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 within our, in our public sector that have a responsibility to manage the, the ecosystem. The governments engage in ongoing tree planting projects all the time, every year, all the time. All right, if there are certain sites, there are, uh, we've got a number of Ramsar sites in St. Lucia, which are protected areas, it's protected ecological areas. These areas and other areas like it, we should be intensifying directing the course of the forestry department, plant these types of trees and plant them in abundance as an ongoing exercise. Okay, Richard. And they, and they have the resources to do it. We'll have to continue this conversation another day. <laughs> you also have to look at the biodiversity of your system complex. Yes. So, that, so it's a whole other conversation and we can take on a separate discussion. Exactly. About about planting for apiculture, but it's something that must happen. You yes. cannot get people excited about doing beekeeping because we have a lot of hungry bees if I beekeepers agree. do not have sufficient lands so that they can be successful. Exactly. Because if we have there, 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 there's an issue right now in Grenada where there's one region where there's a lot of food and about four persons have moved into that area. Nobody owns land in there, so nobody has ownership. So everybody's jostling for a little piece of that area. And their production, everybody's production has dropped. There's a lot of hungry bees, not enough trees for, for the amount of people who wants to set up in that area. So unless we are managing the landscape for apiculture, this yes. idea of having a big industry is going to get problematic. It definitely will fail. Already, I have planted my zone. Every year I'm planting thousands of trees and it's my land. Yes. And already there are people who are thinking they could come and set up in the area. And that's wrong. That's a no-no. So unless you have cooperatives of people or with the government or with forestry really coming together to, to have- Exactly, a, that's my point. Uh, but government doesn't have to do everything. But we're not we relying on them. But they are they are the they are the they are the they are the, they are the key stakeholder as well no, as the people. No, but they are no, critical. No, no, no. no. That's the problem. That's the problem we have. Government's role is to facilitate. Government mm. is not the stakeholder. The government's role is to facilitate development, is to create the policy framework for people to thrive. Government is not the lead. And uh -huh. we are giving government the lead and stepping back and saying the government need to do this, the government to do that. So then we, all of us are, are disempowering ourselves. We need to work together. 
We need to work together. Of course, we need to but, work government collectively. Is, but government is not the key stakeholder. Government is to facilitate the process. That's true. The private sector is the key, so the key stakeholder. Let me correct myself. The private any, sector is the key, would, key stakeholder. I wouldn't call any one person the key stakeholder, but you cannot be blaming the government for everything to happen. If, if you want to make money, you have to put your mode there. You exactly. Have to put your interest there. Step you can't flesh on the table. wait for somebody to give you a handout there all you the go. time. There you you go. have to make your investments also. But there government has a key role to facilitate, to put policy frameworks in place. The, the exactly. development agencies who are helping, they are facilitating. But exactly. the individual now has a responsibility to make it successful. I agree. And, and we need to take up this conversation another time. I but, agree. Um, and, as a, and we need to fit in a few questions. We need to get a few questions in. <laughs> we need to, because okay. we, we, we've definitely hugged the, we've hugged the discussion. Um, let's so this see. is great. Rich, Rich, before you take, let me just make a, a small contribution on the, on the original question. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's a pullback in a way because I can speak from the perspective of a two island state in terms of the value of awards. Right. Um, traditionally, once you live in Tobago, 60, 70,000 people train that 1.2, something like that. Um, and you're going to visit, you have to take Benny Ball or sugar cake or some local stuff. In the case of Tobago, because of 10 years of unparalleled success in beekeeping and, and publicity, people have abandoned Benny Ball and they tell you when you're coming, bring me honey. Don't come unless you bring honey. I'm just pointing that out a little bit in terms of the benefits of, um, of winning awards at National Honey Show. And yes, we've reached the stage, I think, on the island where um, we are seeing uh, reductions in yields. And I think clearly there is a need to go the direction in which uh, Dr. Jesse May is, is suggesting we need to start planting specifically. But generally, generally, um, we don't have a sufficiently wide enough base of interested persons to capitalize on. Exactly. Exists now. exactly. All right. So it needs to be a bipartisan. I've uh, muted for Monica. Monica Smith wants to make a contribution. Please go ahead, Monica. Well, I was just saying how it really starts at a community level. It doesn't really start at a government level. Um, we had just got our city nominated as a B City USA, and that is encouraging the community to build habitats um, and protect habitats for pollinators and other insects. Um, so, you know, she, you know, she kept saying that you know this isn't a government thing. It's not a government thing. And by keep beekeeping organizations, you know, influencing the local community, even if you don't have an area to put a garden. You know, a flower box on your patio or outside your window is enough to benefit. You know, when pollinators are flying over and they're going over these food deserts like she's talking about, you know, they can't make it home. So that that stress makes for unhealthy colonies. And if we're providing plants throughout our communities where these pollinators can go, you know, it's really helping, you know, the health of all these pollinators, not just honeybees alike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed, agreed, agreed. So we need more community involvement. We need more people um, to, you know, to plant. <laughs> I know I, I, there's a community I'm working with in Trinidad, the Brasso Seco Boys. I know the Brasso Seco Boys have a, a massive tree planting activity going in the Brasses in the north. Yeah. Area. Yeah. And planting a lot of trees. So good. I mean, it's a good job to Javed and Winston and the rest of the gang up in up in Brasso Seco planting all these trees. So yes, you know, if you've got the technic the technical skills and know how to germinate your plants, germinate your trees, go for it. And let's plant them and let's get them in the ground and make more honey. So, so for instance, Richard, I planted avocado trees. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? In one of my bee yards. And it's the most avocados I've ever seen. <laughs> the trees are not that big and the, the amount of pollination services yes. we I get from, from, from my bees. Yes. So, so you have to be deliberate, the farmer, the beekeeper, yeah. in what he plants. It's not only things for the bees and then he cannot get another source of income out of the farm, right? right? Avocados, of course, would take some time to 
to, to grow, but there are other things that you can have um, much quicker. And so there has to be a systematic approach to doing this. You could plant a lot of trees and, and, and they may not be trees that are gonna provide any um, pollin pollination benefit or, or, or good quality um, nectar for good quality honey. So it has to be done with a plan um, so that you, you're planting with purpose. Correct, correct. And what about the notion of bee friendly species? We seem to be over manicuring the side of the road and, our, you know, we want lawn. What's wrong with some flowers? I've stopped cutting my yard basically. And, you know, you, you got the vervine and the Christmas bush and all of that um, shooting up right. the litter and you find the bees on it. So, be friendly spaces, be friendly tongues and cities, you know. They, Conceptually, rather than not wanting to see anything growing on the side of the road, wildflowers are beautiful. I, 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 I agree, Gladstone. I'm, They're not I'm, just beautiful, most of them are medicinal plants. There you go, there you go, there you go. So um, let's, let's, let's get another, I, I, my good, so thank you for your contribution, Monica. Um, let's try and grab somebody else. Uh, let's see, ah, oh, gosh. Ah, I think that's Roger. Roger, Roger, are you available to talk? Your hand has been up for some time. Roger McClellan, I'm you. Yes, Roger. Hi, hi. Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon again. Um, just going back to a point that the doctor just said that um, the quality of food that she's getting, especially with the avocado. Now, I grew up on farmland. And I could tell you, planting um, vine crops like pumpkins, watermelons, and then we have um, a lot of corn and these sort of thing. Well, we have an area with a lot of coconuts. We have river and fruit. And believe you me, the kind of crops that my father had been planting over the years, because of honeybees, we have seen really good quality, really good quality stuff over the years. And I mean, no, I'm not getting back into it. Sorry to say that I have stopped for a while due to work and this sort of thing. So I can't wait to get back in it. Now we have a lot of rubber trees in which they get nectar from rubber and all this sort of thing. So it's, it's, it's nice to know that that you guys who are like the leaders in Caribbean beekeeping right now are actually going for the, looking for areas and people who could be energized enough to plant for beekeeping, not just for ourselves or just for the market, but also for the bees also, because it's very important to make sure that the bees get that food. You know, it's very, very important. And I applaud her a lot for that. It, it, we really need to have this drive where we have to plan, especially in the Caribbean, where a lot of development are taking place right now. Where, I mean, as you see, the government, they chop this, chop that, because they want to build a million homes when the year come. So it, 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 it would be hard for a lot of us because I know beekeepers that had to move bees some certain areas, they have to downgrade the amount that they had because of development. But it's we really have to have this drive that we must, must plan for the bees. And it, it would be, to me, it's twofold. It's twofold. Thank you. All right, thanks, Roger. Thank you for your contribution. Um, let's pull back up. Uh, we've got, okay, we've got, um, I think that's... I have four minutes left. I, I, I need to leave here at one o'clock. <laughs> All right. Uh, you want to give a closing comment, Dr. Jessamy, in your, in your four minutes? Well, um, I think it's great that we are, um, excited about apiculture. I got into apiculture through an act of God. <laughs> the bees came, the bees came to the farm and I had the good sense to keep them. 
So I started beekeeping by accident and I've been hooked. So I understand the fever, you know, um, but I have also put a lot of thought and science into what we do because of my training as a scientist. And my advice to yourself and, and everyone is that we can actually make good on a very focused, uh, uh, profitable apiculture industry in the region, but we must create bee farms. We must create bee yards, bee gardens to plant with deliberation for the bees, especially given all the pressures of development and uh, the future risk scenarios for climate change. We cannot take it for granted that the trees are always going to blossom. Um, if you, we are in the tropics, and if you plant the right diversity mix, your bees would have food throughout the year. Right. Not only in one time of the year. So there are some places where you have only glory cedar, and in the rest of the, the, the year, the bees are hungry. So you can deliberately create a planting scheme where you can have food throughout the year, where there is no dearth period because we are in the tropics and I have done that. Um, so we need to bring the, the agronomy, the science, everything into apiculture so that uh, we, can, we can create a high value product. The Caribbean is known for a high value honey. If we go back to the 1800s, if we go back to look at some of the, the medical reports back from the 16th and 1700s, you see Caribbean yes. healing cures with honey in it. Yes. You hear stories about the farmer who is struggling to keep some of these European bees that were imported and he's having a hard time because of the ants and the whatever. And this farmer up on whatever hill, he's doing better. He's got 50 hives and all of that was before Langstroth. Yes. <laughs> okay. And so the Caribbean is known for having imported European bees. The first recording of that was somewhere in 1616. Yes. And have this foundation for producing honey based on the medicinal wild plants. So there is there is there is hope for a good apiculture sector, but it has to be married with something else so that it could be successful. It has to be married to some form of agriculture so that you can deliberately, like in New Zealand, New Zealand honey manuka is linked to the planting of the tea tree. Yes. So people deliberately plant tea tree farms and they get the tea tree oil. So there's a tea tree industry and a manuka honey industry, right? And both are very valuable. So this is my my next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dr. Okay. Jessime, I just want to thank you immensely for your time and your input and your insight. Um, I know this we've, this session will go up on YouTube and on um, on Facebook, so persons that are tuned in can segment. I'll even probably just do a special section just on Dr. Dr. Jessimi's contribution to today's session, have it as a separate on YouTube. Let them, let them know that I'm in my farm clothes. <laughs> right, farm clothes or not, you still, you, it's what's in the head, man. It's what's in the mind, that's what's important. The appearance okay. is, is, is uh, material, the mind. I think the message that you shared today is invaluable. I know uh, Mr. Romulus has probably got taken, making notes. I saw he's posted a few comments. Um, okay. Uh, in the chat, so uh, uh, giving you some accolades. So I'm sure he, in his closing comments, and I'm seeing that a lot of persons are saying, "Dr. Jessimi, Dr. Jessimi, go, go, go." So I know that you're, you've made a very, very your, even your time was short, and you've probably gone over. Yes, <laughs> gone over your allotted time. I am yeah. truly, I'm truly grateful that you were able to spare that time with us. And I think it's, it's what your contribution has been fantastic. And I think as always, we need to try to not steal your ideas, 
but try to emulate some of the things that you have done. Um, I'm a true believer there's, you've got a lot of personal equity in your projects that you've developed. So I don't expect, hey, Rama, what trees did you exactly plant? Can you tell me <laughs> the long list of trees? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do my own research and I'm gonna do my own homework and I'm gonna try and- The, the thing is, it's, it's based on your location and your soil. So oh. what does best in one region may not do well in another region. So you have to understand your region and develop um, so that there's also environmental sustainability built into right. what you're doing. Good, good, yes, good. And I have to thank yourself and Gladstone for the work that you're doing and, and the encouragement that you're giving also to me and to, to other persons. So thank you so much for this. I know Gladstone wants to say something. I right. see I put my head on a block. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. so we take mine yeah, instead. Not, not up here. <laughs> okay, so thank you guys so much. And but keep up me. Thank you, thank you, man. The pleasure is always mine. Keep thank you. Work. Keep up the good work. Okay, everybody, the enjoy bye. the rest of the workshop. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Okay, good. Bye bye. All right, bye bye. Okay, um, everybody. So it's the last. We're the last two men standing. Gladstone. <laughs> yep. Um, I'm sure Mr. Romulus has his hand up and he's going to, he's going to close off, uh, close off. Uh, you can go ahead and unmute your mic, sir, please. Thank you, thank you. Uh, wow, what a, what a morning, what a finale, what a high point to end on. I, I hope this, this is ending in, in, a, in a climax and what Vimla has done is bring us uh, face to face with the um, integrated approach to apiculture, a more scientific approach, yes. a more managed approach, an approach that can help us to protect our biodiversity at the same time, have even viable apiaries in the Caribbean. I think she's made a very, very strong argument for us to look at the entire industry and uh, let us do an analysis. Let us look at the components of that industry. How we can own it, manage it, develop it, nurture it for the benefits of our, ourselves, our economies, our countries, our people. I think um, the, the moving towards this uh, um, uh, honey tasting competition will be one way of pushing our apiculturists towards higher standards. I think we should maintain that. We should thrive to have a very successful program at the end of the year in December. And I think you fellows are Gladstone and Vimla and Richard. You all, you, you all belong to the uh, to the faculty man, of, of apiculture in Canada. And maybe we have a pro vice chancellor and a chancellor there, and a dean of the faculty of apiculture there. We have all three of you there, as the, and, and and I'm sure the others will have been senior lecturers in that faculty of apiculture in Canada. Um, and we will depend on you all to assist as we develop our, uh, our apiculture in the Caribbean. But we must also begin to do some documenting as well in the Caribbean. Our history is not one. We are very good speakers, but not very good documenters. And we therefore have to begin that documenting process and bring in real science into the analysis and also into the uh, <clears throat> helping us to plan how we develop that uh, um, that uh, industry. I don't think we have to begin to advocate uh, uh, for, for policies that are be sensitive, uh, be protective, and that can help our um, industry to thrive. I agree with Emma, let us get government to put the policy and the framework in place so that we can expand that industry. I think, you know, more than anything else, you know, we've been talking about uh, something that is authentically Caribbean, something that can give us an identity, something that can make a stand in this period of food security and nutritional security. I really believe um, developing apiculture in Eastern Caribbean will help us on several different levels. And it can be at the, at the low end of the very small one acre farmer to the very large 50 acre farmer. Um, but we have to develop it in which in a period where information is available, the science is available, the training is available when required, the extension requirements are available, and of course we have a plan and a strategy and a vision as well. You know, I, I, I often believe in the Caribbean 
our visions have been externally set, manipulated, and developed by others. And what that has done is to turn us into mendicants and uh, looking for handouts from the uh, so-called first world, first world countries. I believe we have an opportunity in agriculture to turn that that thinking around and make it make the dynamic emanate Im from within the Caribbean. Let us develop, let us turn to our culture, let us turn to our history and get that strength, you know. Let us jump from there, what Martin Carter, the, the uh, guy is from that nigger year of yesterday into, into today where there are possibilities infinite and let us develop that industry. Let us begin to work at different levels. And this in respects is what the Jeff is going to do. That is why we have invested time and we have just invested resources and we are trying to work at all different levels for our knowledge fair. The policy and the legal area, the ideation component, we are integrating climate change and the lessons from that. We are trying to promote our, our small uh, uh, bee farmers so that they can uh, transcend the psychological barrier to development. And that is one of the things we have to do in the Caribbean. We have to build so much confidence that the negativity and the challenges and the fears are relegated to this archaeological heap of the Caribbean and become people who are seeing possibilities all the time, who are seeing, who are, who are identifying the challenges, but are able to transcend those challenges. Yep. That's ours, let this Caribbean of ours become not a beacon, but a spotlight of change in the area of agriculture. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for contributing. Thanks, Vimla. Thanks, Gladstone. Thanks, Richards. And also our contributors, contributors from North America. We are grateful for that. And I think we are now on our way. Let that, that we be uh, what uh, produces benefits for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Romulus. Um, Gladstone, any final words from you, sir? Hi, Richard. Um, you know, sometimes you have burning passions. Um, and when, when you participate in events like this, you, it's a reassurance, you know, that um, things are, are being realized. Um, so, you know, I just want to congratulate, you know, all of us, you know, not, not just congratulate, but um, ask, you know, Rich, let me, let me just give me a half a second. <laughs> Uh, um. All right. I, I, I'm going to this book, right? I mean, right, this is the proceedings of the first Caribbean Beekeeping Congress we held in 1990. Um, and I think they said it because I quoted, ironically, you are speaking from. And I quoted the chairman. Um, sorry, your prime minister at the time. So for my welcome address in 1998, I said earlier this month, the chairman of CARICOM and the honorable prime minister of St. Lucia, Dr. Kenny Anthony made an official visit to Tobago. Dr. Anthony was quoted as saying, despite the fact that water, that waters separate us, we are shaping a new civilization. Whether it be in politics, in sports, or in arts. Mr. Chairman, having witnessed what I consider to be the overwhelming response of our Caribbean brothers and sisters, and indeed our brothers and sisters from beyond the region, I wish to suggest to Dr. Anthony that we are also shaping a new civilization in beekeeping. This is what is happening now. <laughs> you know, um, Sir Romulus, thank you for being here. We, 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 we need to make have a unique space. The Caribbean could be the salvation for the world bees. It could be a zone of conservation for bees because of our islandness. You know, so um, these are just insights. 
And we need to involve academics. We need to involve uh, different aspects of technology. We need to get more hands-on in the industry. I'm, I'm getting a sense in a very meaningful way, you know, after 30 odd years or so in the industry that this thing has been going on and it's growing, it's crescendoing. So I'm elated, man. I'm, I'm sort of over the moon, you know? <laughs> so I, I'm one of the happiest guys in the world today because of what happened the last few days and the energy that I know is resonating within the region, you know, and the things that are happening in the respective islands. So let's, let's, let's keep pushing, man. Let's make it happen. Yes, do like yes. Nike, just do it. That's it. That's great, great words, Brother Solomon. I I can I I hundred hundred and ten percent agree with both yourself and Mr. Romulus. Um, I'm not wanting to belabor everybody's overdue lunch. Um, I would just like to say to remember when you log out, please complete the exit survey um, so that we can at least see where everybody's at and you know we can help build the profile so that jeff sgp undp can make more interventions of this nature so that we can help you we can work with jeff to help build help us build our industry we are as the as the primary beneficiaries we as the beekeepers have to shape the future we want for our sector from the ground up by ourselves um, and it's important that we make that investment in time um, and effort. We educate ourselves, we equip ourselves, we network to, with one another to help bring up the industry to where we want it. Um, as Dr. Jessamy rightly said, um, you know, we need to look at our environments and help shape the environments with plants, sources that can best help us. Um, I, as a breeder, um, you know, I, I kind of neglect the honey side of the business and I more focus on the breeding side of the business. And I, I leave the honey side to champions um, such as yourselves. Um, you know, um, you know, you'll come battle it out with the flowers, man. I, I just I'm just going to make bees, man, <laughs> because at the end of the day, we're all doing the same thing. We're turning yep. nectar. Nectar into bees, uh, um, and that's basically what we're doing. And the endless supply of nectar we have in the Caribbean, we can just make more, and more, and more, and more, and more, and more bees. Uh, and and that's my that's my stand standpoint. So, I just want to thank everybody who participated. I special thanks to to um, to um, Jennifer and Carla who gave their time freely all the way from the United States. Special, special thanks to Gladstone and Dr. Jessamy, who once again gave their time freely, um, you know, just the, for the ability to share the experiences and their knowledge, the knowledge. I'm sure nobody who, other than a small select few people, knew that the Caribbean had had so many furries into the international honey competition scene in the United Kingdom. And that Grenada, Grenada, and Trinidad and Tobago were the pioneers, really clearing the way for everything that we have we we, we have done quietly. I think and it's that's not a, for us. entry since 1987. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important now for us to really galvanize these individual efforts and pull them together, pull them together in one very strong, potent um, piece of energy. And let's move on. So like, I'd rather having these little beams of light individually piercing the darkness. Let's bring all these beams of light together and make one powerful beam of light that can really bright, take the darkness out of apiculture, bring us into light, bring us into the 21st century. It's important that we light up this space and really move forward together as a single unit um, because we can only overcome the barriers of entering markets of, you know, even selling honey to one another. It's a, it's a, it's a problem. So we really need to, 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 to um, you know, break down these barriers and work like our, our bees and have a, a single focus. I think the regional project that um, Mr. Romulus and his team um, of, 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 of um, national coordinators throughout the six 
and the seventh island in the South Pacific um, will go a long way in, 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 in focusing that light into a single beam, which can hopefully illuminate the whole Caribbean region. And as we gain success, we can bring more partners from the region into the project so we can make this light even brighter. Um, um, so, you know, so let us try to work together um, let's keep it together. I, I'm gonna take bef I'm gonna I'm I, I'm gonna take one or two questions. I'm gonna take one or two questions um, from the participants um, before we go. I think Miss Lauren Archibald has her hands up. So let me just take a quick question from Lauren, and then I'm gonna close off. Lauren, unmute your mic and go ahead, please, if you're still here. Yes, go I'm ahead. Hi, good afternoon. It's not really a question, but I just want to commend you all for such great presentations, such great workshop. I am not a beekeeper, but from all the information that I've gathered here, honestly speaking, I would love to get into beekeeping. And um, I'm the coordinator here at the Gender Affairs Department on Nevis. And this is one of the things that we were looking at that, yes. you know, it would have been good to get women involved in beekeeping, yes. especially in times like these where a lot of women, you know, because, you know, more women, a lot of women are being employed in the tourism industry. And this would have been an opportune time for them to get into beekeeping. Yes. Also, what we did was a backyard gardening seminar where we had trained a few persons to do backyard gardening. And that too would have gone well. The beekeeping would have gone well with the backyard, you know, gardening. So um, I am therefore just commending you all on this excellent um, training. I was just browsing through Facebook and I came upon it and I said, okay, let me just, you know, see if I would get accepted to listen to this thing. And I, I must say, I really enjoyed it. And I'm glad that I, you know, uh, had our um, sign in to say, well, I am interested. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Romulus wants to say a few words. Mr. Romulus? Uh, no, no, not exactly, uh, Richard. I want to say thanks to everybody. I, I think we have started a good thing. Uh, perhaps we need to create a virtual uh, uh, apiculture academy in the Caribbean, where we three months or so we have uh, you know have have, uh, have a session online uh, that promotes uh, apiculture in the Caribbean. Because one of the things in the Caribbean, nothing in the Caribbean just happens. Yes. We have to be the change agents, and we have to begin by uh, promoting it in the various fora. I mean, at the OECS level, uh, at the Caribbean level at our meeting level, at our district level, we have to begin to uh, slow the process of transformation at different levels in, in the society because we have to find a way to survive and to thrive on these rocks we call the archipelago in the Caribbean. And I think apiculture can do this in many, many ways, particularly as apiculture, a sound environment, a sound environment full of integrity can go hand in glove and also food security. I think if we can marry those three things, and of course biodiversity, agriculture, food security, nutritional security, health, <clears throat> I think we have a international uh, brand that cannot be beaten. Well, thanks, sir, Richard. Okay, sir. Um, yes, so I think, um, Lorraine, I think I hope that's answered your question. Um, uh, uh, we got who else has the hand up? Peter Mitchell from St. Lucia. Peter Mitchell, I've unmuted you. Please make your contribution quickly. Yeah, just um, what Dr. Jessamy said was just um, so close to my heart because when I, I actually came into beekeeping almost by accident because I just realized I had some trees in, in, in my, my orchard and I realized there were so many bees come from wherever. So I decided if bees can come in, why don't I just start uh, my, my own apiary right right on in the orchard? And then through that time, I just kept on planting more trees, looking around, seeing what trees the bees like. And when I don't have space, I do a lot of vining crops, like the, oh, the, 
the the the, the cucumbers, the the pumpkin, the 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 frozen food, any anything any, anything that that that, that mm-hmm. binds and gives a lot of nectar. I kept I kept doing that, and and, and now my the, the the trees are always so loaded. Even the neighbors now <laughs> trees are becoming loaded too because they have trees and they depend on my bees. So all in all, it's just working together. Is and and it's great stuff. The whole thing has been a, a, a great a great inspiration. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, um, Peter Mitchell. Great stuff, man. All the way from Schwazel oh. in um in, in the south of the island. Great stuff, Peter. Thanks. Um, okay, I think we've got. We'll take a couple quick more. Um, uh, Mr. Small Barbados, I think that is Galaxy J Six. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Small. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Um, you- what, what, what I want to say is, um, this is so great um, happening, you know, and, and Sibusha is behind it all, which is good. But at the end of the day, what we need to do in, in terms of what Miss Jessamy said, Dr. Jessamy, is that we definitely need to plant bee plants throughout the Caribbean. And I came across some bitter honey in one of my locations. And I tell the guys, my guys that work, I said that this could be a medicinal product. And we need to get into involved in the testing of the whatever medicinal properties that are in our honeys because when I go over there, of it's like people producing honey and that kind of stuff. So we definitely need to. Hello? Hello? Yeah, we were losing you for a bit. Richard. Yes, I was we were losing you so for a bit. I said um yeah, what I said um Dr. Jesse me today um really brought it out in terms of um, planting the Caribbean, um I'm looking for ear prees that planted plants and that kind of stuff. Because as you know, avocado is one of the greatest um, producers of nectar. And also what we're doing in the Caribbean is so good to see Glaston here, Glaston, here, Jennifer. Uh, and they're doing their thing in, in, in terms of helping us. And, oh, and you talk about bees. I, I will be willing to help you. Um, I was training identifying um, the African, African bee and that kind of stuff and in terms of Nozima. I, I will be willing to help and give you a hand in terms of that, that kind of work. Great stuff, man. Thanks, thanks, David. Greatly appreciate that you're contribution, welcome. my brother. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, yeah. take care. Um, moving on, let's let's try and get one last one. Um, we've got uh, Factum Factum John. I, I can't uh, please if you unmute, unmute your mic and make a contribution, sir or madam. Fashuti F A C H O T T I E John. You just unmute your mic and make a contribution, please. We run out of time. Okay, no problem. All right, that may be an error. 10 seconds. All right, let's move on. Um, anybody else? We've got small, we've got everybody. Clive, Risa, do you wanna say one more last comment? I know you, you, I see you've got a few questions in the group. If you wanna say, no, she's left already, okay. All right, well, on that note, I think we had a great session. Um, anybody that wants to reach out to me directly, I've posted my, um, you should have my contact information from the, inv- from the invite from, from Zoom. Um, you can always buzz me an email if you need to get any of the presenters contact information, I could always respond to you. Or if you need any information about beekeeping generally, um, you can go to our Facebook page or go to our website, ayanolaapiculture.org, and there'll be lots of information there for you. Uh, I have some calyx, any link with plants and flowers available in the Caribbean for foraging as well as seasons. Yeah, there's lots of information on that, Iverson, but that's a whole topic all by itself. Um, we'll have to email on that, on that one. Um, all right, so I think this has been fantastic. I. I, I knew it would have been, we would have put on a great show. 
I just didn't think it would have been as good as this. Um, you know, and I'm really happy for all the panelists, all the panelists that participated and all the participants from across the globe who participated. I'm really happy to see you guys go out there and really participated. I'm really happy um, to see that the interaction obviously shows that there's a thirst and a desire for information on apiculture from the region. And I know myself and Gladstone and Mr. Romanus will do our best to get that information out to you all. Um, I will add everybody who participate in this session to the ACBO um, uh, mailing list. So she will get our quarterly magazine um, that has loads of information. And if you want anything to know information, you know, you can get it there or go to the Iron Order Apiculture Collective Facebook page or our YouTube stream and you can get some lots of information there. So on that note, thank you everybody um, for what you've done and all your, t and your time. And, um, you know, bless. Keep up, look after your bees, man, and focus. Thank you very much. All the best. Gladstone, sign off, man. All the best. Yeah, brother. <laughs> all right, take care. Peace and love, man. Bye.